Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Hi, I'm Suzanne Spaulding, the Senior Advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where I lead the Defending Democratic Institutions Project. Uh, and I want to welcome you all to the Future Strategies Forum. And I hope for a number of you, I'm welcoming you back because the forum started yesterday, got off to a great start with a wonderful keynote from Ann Neuberger, the Deputy National Security Advisor for Cybersecurity at the NSC, and a wonderful panel talking about emerging technology and war fighting. Um, today, we've got a great group assembled to talk about statecraft and emerging technologies below the level of kinetic action. Uh, uh, outside the context of war fighting, but, but challenges and opportunities nevertheless. And we've got a great group uh, assembled today, and I'm going to introduce them. Um, we're, we, uh, we've got Jenny ba uh, Badanis uh, from Microsoft, who is the Director of Strategic Projects for Microsoft's Defending Democracy Program. Uh, Jenny and I have worked together on uh, projects uh, up at Harvard, for example, on uh, defending democratic uh, digital democracy around elections. She's focused on countering the growth of th the threat of nation state attacks against vulnerable democratic institutions globally all over the world. Jenny has over 15 years of experience at the intersection of politics and technology. She's been recognized uh, as one of campaign and elections rising stars. She's also received the American Association of Political Consultants 40 Under 40 Award. Really thrilled that Jenny could be with us. Christy Lawrence is here. She's the Director for Research and Analysis at the National Commission on Artificial Intelligence. Uh, she's working there on international artificial intelligence cooperation, international AI R&D, uh, international technical standards, and intellectual property. Previous to that, she worked at Harvard's Belfer Center's Cyber Project, where she co-authored The Case for Increased Transatlantic Cooperation on Artificial Intelligence. She's previously worked at the State Department and as a management consultant. And she is a concurrent uh, MPP and JD candidate at the Harvard Kennedy School and Stanford Law School. Busy woman. Camille Stewart, my former colleague at the Department of Homeland Security. She is currently a Harvard Belfer Center Cyber Fellow. We've rated uh, their excellent ranks for today's panel. Um, she's a New America Political Reform Fellow and Atlantic Council a DFR Lab Fellow. She is currently serving as Global Head of Product Security Strategy at Google. Uh, she previously led the security and privacy policy for Google's Android and Google's Play divisions. And as I referenced uh, at the outset, she served as a Senior Policy Advisor for Cyber, Infrastructure, and Resilience Policy at DHS. Uh, in the Obama administration, where she focused on a number of domestic and international cyber and tech policy issues. She's also held leadership roles at Deloitte and Cyvalence Inc., which is now Zero Fox. Great to have you with us, Camille. Uh, last but not least is uh, Sana Vershuren. Uh, Sorry if I got that wrong. Uh, Sana is a PhD candidate in political science at Brown University and a pre-doctoral fellow with Harvard Belfer Center's International Security Program. Her research interests include the development of military technology, shifts in military strategy and tactics, and the role of ideas and norms therein. Her dissertation examines why and how states decide to procure different weapons capabilities within similar military domains. Sana's research has been supported by the National Science Foundation, the Horowitz Foundation for Social Policy, and the Belgian American Education Foundation, among others. Prior to graduate school, she inter interned with the UN Office of Disarmament Affairs, the Flemish Peace Institute, 
and the Center for International Politics of Conflict, Rights, and Justice. So I think you will agree that we've got a terrific team assembled here. And I'm going to start out by asking each of you to just give us a couple of thoughts on what you think might be some of the most significant um, challenges and opportunities for statecraft, for nation states, uh, for governance, for governments, as they, as they think about their role in the context of emerging technologies. Um, so, Ginny, I'm going to start with you. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, look, this is such a big question, and we could we could take it a lot of different directions. The first thing I thought of when I was trying to consider what a big challenge it is when you're talking about emerging technology and and governance is essentially when something is emerging, it means essentially it's new, and when it's new, it's probably going to be hard to understand. And so, while it's a a sort of a maybe an obvious point to make. The biggest challenge I think tends to come from getting that understanding to people in positions of power within governments in order to make informed decisions. And a lot of times you want to make those decisions early, um, but that's the biggest challenge is the information's not there, the understanding is not there. And how do you make something that is emerging, not yet an emergency, feel uh, important enough to pay attention to early on? So one example would be post-quantum um, cryptography. Right. I mean, this is a thing that we have known about for a while, at least as far back as 2015. There have been reports saying, you know, by 2030, I think is the latest I've seen, we're going to have our entire um, encryption ecosystem uh, blown up by quantum computing. And like that's, you know, there's good news and bad news to that. Uh, the good news is we have time, you know, that's pretty far away. There is time to establish some standards and to have conversations with with people in, in positions of power. The, the bad thing is, there's time, there's maybe too much time. Um, and so in order to make this feel like something that is actually an emergency that we need to be focused on and that we need to collaborate with other stakeholders, that's going to be a huge challenge. There's been on that particular issue, a lot of progress, um, but other emerging technologies are going to face similar problems. You just have to get that knowledge to the right people. Great, Camille. Excellent framing, Jenny. I think it's really important to emphasize how important it will be for governments and stakeholders to think about how they meet the moment on these challenges. I mean, AI and machine learning and how those scale attacks as well as are able to scale response is another great example. How are we going to meet adversaries as they leverage these capabilities in a way that is much more agile than governments are able to do, but even worse if they are not getting ahead of this capability. Um, another opportunity is confidential computing. If governments are able to adopt that early, they can secure information during processing, not just during transit or at rest. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities on the horizon as well as challenges that if governments, if stakeholders take this moment to get ahead, to educate themselves and to collaborate with industry as they're developing these things, we can meet that moment. Christy, I know you your work on the AI Commission, on the Artificial Intelligence Commission, um, has really gone a long way to help educate policymakers, as Ginny and Camille have talked about. But also, importantly, at least perhaps equally important, is to educate the public, right? Which is which is uh, one of the principal sources of motivation, certainly for policymakers in Congress to take action, as if they think their constituents care. Um, what do you see as some of the most significant challenges and, and opportunities? Thank you so much. And, and um, for background on the commission, it was created by Congress in, in 2018 to really advance artificial intelligence, machine learning, and associated technologies to uh, protect the United States national security and defense. And so, I mean, following up on excellent comments from, um, from the other panelists in that artificial intelligence really does and has led to new arenas for global competition. And the reality is we're facing a uh, strategic competitors that have identified artificial intelligence and another, other emerging technologies as critical tools for them to leapfrog American leadership. So we're seeing uh, political arenas and, and policy tools like intellectual policy, like international uh, uh, intellectual property, international technical standards. We're seeing those become tools uh, to weaponize and advance uh, a governance model that export authoritarianism and, and really is attempting to show an alternative to 
democracy and innovation that's really important for both America and, and our allies and partners. And so this proposes a lot of challenges for the United States and our allies and partners because we need to reorganize and come from a position of strength and unity. Um, the State Department needs to be re reorganized to address competitive diplomacy in a digital era. Uh, we need to propose new mechanisms and emerging technology coalition to align with our allies and partners and, and not erect artificial uh, impediments to international collaboration, but, but really reorient for the strategic competition. Great. And, and it's not only important that we form a unified uh, front and mobilize with our partners, but that we're able to do so at home to mobilize our own public. Uh, which is increasingly a challenge to get folks to agree and reach consensus around a movement forward, which is one of the reasons that um, our project Defending Democratic Institutions has been talking about the renewal of civics education as a national security imperative. Sana, you have really been you know, taking a, a national security defense kind of focus on some of these issues. And from that perspective, what do you see as some of the greatest challenges and, and opportunities here. Okay, fantastic. Um, thank you very much for having me today. It's such a pleasure to be on such a fantastic panel. Um, so I wanna make two big points. Um, so the first one is that technology isn't autonomous. It's not something that falls out of the sky. It is the product of our society. So it reflects our own desires and our biases. So if we think about some of the problems around um, facial recognition um, for people of color, for example, like this is a reflection of, of the way our society um, is, is structured. And um, same if we think about drones, drones for example, um, drones um, weren't, didn't create targeted killing, but rather they enabled a particular version of targeted killing that emerged after 9-11 um, in, in, the, in the framework of a particular foreign policy. And then the second point I'd like to make is that technology is already here. It's important to look at the future, but in our future gaze, we don't want to not recognize what's already here. So technological development is incremental and like things like AI um, have been around, attempts at thinking machines and all these kinds of things have been around for a very, very long time. Um, and some of these technologies are already here. Facial rec automate target recognition, um, defensive systems that operate autonom automated in um, a context of having um, too short of a time for um, human involvement, loitering, etc. Um, so, um, and in addition, the way we should think about these, some of these tools are systems in and of itself, but others are um, applications and tools that will enhance existing capabilities and systems. So these are like kind of the uh, points I'd like to make. Thank you. Yeah, terrific. I think and particularly your last point about, you know, making sure that we focus not just on that underlying technology, but on the applications of that technology. And what are the implications of that, of those applications? Um, uh, Beverly Kirk, who really sort of is the, the uh, honchoing this whole future strategy forum, uh, tweeted one of her favorite comments from yesterday's conversation was, uh, it's not just about the tech, it's about what you do with it, right? It is, so we're, we're very concerned now about the build out of 5G, but are we thinking enough about what are the applications of that that we need to be worrying about? Um, same with quantum and AI, right? It's, there's, a, there's one as aspect that is a competitive aspect of just the underlying technology, but then there's also both the competitive and the societal impact of those applications. So, so uh, Camille, one of the things, uh, you know, Ginny talked about um, the, you know, how do we get priority on something that is just emerging? Uh, it's hard enough to get uh, focused policymaker attention when the house is burning down. You and I know this from cybersecurity, as does Ginny and others on this call, on this uh, panel. Um, you know, what is, how do we get that? Is it, is it partly the way we're organized as a government? You, you served at DHS, you know, based on that kind of experience, what do you think? What, what would be the most important kind of things we should do differently, at, at least in terms of organization, uh, to be able to be, to show greater alacrity in addressing these emerging challenges and opportunities? Yeah, I think the question is really twofold. 
are we organized correctly and are we resourced correctly? And for the first one, we have an opportunity in this moment with the National Cyber Director being a formalized position and someone getting ready to be installed, let's hope that that happens, um, and building out that office and how that fits in the broader picture. There is a focus on implementation from that office but there's also a lot of opportunity for what powers are bestowed upon the National Cyber Director versus the National Security Council versus the head of CISA. Um, another role that needs to have the nominee install, right? So we get those leaders in place and figure out exactly who owns what, how, and how we can operate accordingly. Codify that in a new version of PPD 41 so that we can be organized appropriately. Um, I think we have the bones, but there are some needs that we've seen emerge in some of the recent attacks. Um, but folks like Alex Stamos have talked about if we have some kind of national transportation and safety type board. I mean, that functionality should live in CISA. So how do we build that and resource that appropriately? Um, how do we make sure that the implementation work that the National Cyber Director is doing supports the operational work that's happening in CISA and allows them to focus therein? How do we make sure that the linkages that they are seeking to create with the uh, in, with industry facilitate feeding that kind of information sharing and collaboration that CISA is supposed to be driving from an operational perspective? And then how are they both working with the National Security Council to create cyber policies and strategies that span the interagency or are leveraging the best of what each agency has to bear to drive towards the president's priorities. So I think we're in a unique moment where there are some tweaks that can be made to how the interagency functions and how each of the key players function such that we could be primed and ready to meet this moment. And then of course, there's a lot of resourcing that needs to happen. We need to update Einstein. We need to um, be able to be more agile in our procurement such that we can facilitate meeting how technology is evolving. We talked a lot about um, being ready and being aware of these challenges. But if they're not resourced, you can be as ready as you'd like to be, but we can't meet the moment. So funding will be a really big piece of this and creating new structures, new funding apparatuses, um, and new opportunities for the government to be a bit more agile. Yeah, um, Ginny, Camille referenced uh, a couple times there the relationship with the private sector. Um, it does seem to me that one of the interesting challenges, and you all have touched on this, of, of emerging technologies and statecraft is the changing relationship between the government and private sector. We'll talk in, in a bit about the changing relationship between the government and the governed, um, which includes the private sector, but specifically, you know, I just think it's so interesting when you look, for example, at the kinds of the role that Microsoft has played in taking down botnets, uh, you, you know, using our courts, for example. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how we should be uh, how we should be thinking about that government relationship with the private sector, particularly in this context of trying to be to show greater alacrity to get out ahead of uh, the challenges from emerging technologies and take full opportunity, take full advantage of the opportunities. Sure. Well, I mean, the, the question uh, almost has the answer built into it, which is essentially noting that technology companies and other companies, other private sector entities, are key stakeholders in all of these conversations. And I think what is um, really positive is that we have seen both on the international global level as well as within the U.S. and um, interagency interactions that that's been acknowledged. I think uh, the the way that diplomacy used to be done, for example, just between nation states um, and you know the private sector sort of was woven in later, uh, especially when you're dealing with issues of emerging technologies or something that is directly relevant to the technology sector. You're seeing those companies and those individuals being brought in at an earlier stage, contributing to the conversation. Um, and I, I think that that is a very positive thing in the in the right step forward, um, acknowledging that there are times, of course, for for countries to deal directly in diplomacy, but there's also a role for technology companies to play. So, I mean, your question really, again, sort of is the answer, which is that we need to look at who are stakeholders in this process and bringing them in earlier, having them at the table as full participants. That way, they also have uh, some responsibility. Um, in the decisions that are being made. They have skin in the game. Um, when you're part of the solution that's being drafted, it's a lot harder to argue um, with what has been put in front of you, right? Um, and that you're just responding to. So I've seen a lot of, we've all seen a lot of great move uh, moves in the right direction on that. Um, within the US around cybersecurity, which is, as you've noted, an area that we've seen a lot of advances lately. 
um, that's really been very key. The Biden administration has done a great job of reaching out to technology companies, bringing them in and making sure that they're a part of the solution as we're dealing with the ramp up of these cyber attacks. Um, and again, that's a that's a positive thing. And we just frankly need more of that. Well, Chrissy, one of the areas um, that I know we we need to focus on, in addition to that broader diplomatic uh, uh, um, context, where the private sector has not traditionally been been brought in uh, early, but as Jenny says, we're doing better, um, is the standards process, which can be so critically important, and I think has been undervalued um, and and under resourced, and certainly understaffed. Uh, for quite some time. You want to speak a bit to that point? Yeah, thank you so much for that wonderful question. And, and we uh, at the commission completely agree and, and and think that international standards is an area where the United States government really needs to uh, improve its approach to how it engages at international technical standard setting bodies, um, particularly to ensure that these technical standard setting bodies uh, are maintain their neutrality, maintain their integrity, um, become avenues for the United States and, and other like-minded allies and partners and the private sector to ensure that the that artificial intelligence and digital technologies are developed uh, in, in ways that are secure, resilient, reliable, and trustworthy. Um, and so to address that, the commission does have a suite of recommendations that really starts at the top with leadership. So we recommend that the White House should have a technology competitiveness council that would look uh, that would develop a national technology strategy and really address some of the points that uh, both of the other panelists have already brought up. It's important to have a strategy. It's important to have leadership at the top. It needs to be beyond just cybersecurity, but include artificial intelligence. And a part of that would be to have a strategy on international technical standard setting. Uh, there should be an interagency coordination task force that's led by NIST. There should be proper resourcing and prioritization across the departments and agencies so that those at the DOD, those at the Department of State, those that are actually um, uh, consumers of technical standards are actually able to attend these technical standard setting meetings, contribute in meaningful ways, and, and really ensure that technical standards continue to be uh, the boon for, um, for innovation and ensuring that there is interoperability across you know, the entire world and not become tools for promoting the authoritarian use of technology. And then in addition to that, we do make a number of recommendations on uh, stand up, uh, sorry, norms for artificial intelligence. So there's the technical standards, but there's also a great need for international collaboration and for the United States to take a leadership position in promoting norms for the responsible development and use of technology. And here's an, another area where it's absolutely critical to have the private sector to be involved because ultimately the private sector are the actors who and stakeholders that are creating AI enabled technologies and selling them in different markets and in, in some in sometimes even um, providing them to developing countries to meet a demand and ensure that there's an overcoming of the digital divide. But again, it'll be really critical for the United States government to work with civil society and uh, the private sector to ensure that there's uh, appropriate uses and there's guidelines and that we're really thinking critical to ensure that artificial intelligence strengthens democracy and is, is not used to undermine privacy and civil liberties. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a huge challenge that we face uh, reconciling, uh, understanding how democracy is a strength in this battle and how we can continue to um, to compete uh, and where necessary fight in ways that play to our strengths as a democracy, as opposed to what I, I you sometimes hear, which sounds like kind of autocratic envy of <laughs> uh, uh, some of our uh, um, adversaries. And um, so we we got a question from one of our viewers. Um, uh, kind of about these gray zone activities, son. I'm gonna I'm gonna pose it to you. Uh, it's clear that foreign actors are willing to weaken the democratic process in Western countries using a variety of methods. Uh, and the question is, uh, can the West retaliate using cyberspace, using liberal values, or other non-kinetic means? And I would say other democracy strength, uh, you know, tools. Um, 
to threaten the CPP? And if so, how could the CPP retaliate uh, trying to play chess here? Yeah. OK, thank you for that fantastic question. Um, so I think I, I want to start by saying something that was said on the panel yesterday, too, which is that we want to be careful about not hyping the threat from China. We want to be careful about the language we use here, especially because these are um, areas in which um, we need to look for cooperation as well as um, competition, um, especially if we're talking about global governance and building norms. Um, I think it's important to reach out. Um, and at the same time, I think when we think about the adversary's capabilities, we cannot leave behind questions about intent. What is really driving Russia and China to pursue particular technologies? If we, for example, think about the development of hypersonics, I mean, I think that there is also a question of looking at how some of this is um, an arms race around vulnerabilities, right? Like we started out with missile defense and we've got kind of a response. Um, so I think we want to be careful when we're developing these technologies and, and choosing these strategies um, that we think about the unintended yet and sometimes foreseeable consequences of the way we construct and develop things. And I think we also want to be careful because the threat environment can change in many, many different ways and change quite dramatically. Um, so we don't want to get locked into particular um, developments of technologies. Um, and in general, um, I think the military um, needs to think a lot about interoperability um, of some of these capabilities and um, bringing some of the allies um, into the conversation um, and build broad coalitions around these questions. Great. Um, <clears throat> we've got a couple questions that kind of go to workforce, uh, which we've touched upon, but but um, haven't really uh, done a deep dive. Christy, uh, 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 we've got a question about what the U.S. is doing to prepare for the competition on talent around artificial intelligence. And clearly, um, you know, all of you can jump in because it applies across the board to emerging technologies. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And actually, uh, it's one of the four pillars that the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence really focused on, which is that there is a true uh, competition for global AI talent. And the commission makes a number of recommendations that we do think are really integral and necessary to address this shortfall. So first, um, that we need to find and ensure that there are really great career opportunities for the technologists that are already in government. Uh, second, that we need to create new pipelines to ensure that technologists outside of government are involved in government. And so we have a couple of really large um, recommendations there. So one would be for the creation of a national, civilian national digital reserve corps, and also for the creation of a US Digital Service Academy, which we think would go a long way of helping address the, uh, the scarcity of AI talent and emerging technology talent across the government. Um, we also recommend that the Biden administration or that the United States government pass the National, Def uh, National Defense Education Act, which would help address um, the need to train and increase our education for STEM talent, K through 12, provide graduate and undergraduate fellowships, uh, providing reskilling and retraining, and also address some of our immigration uh, visas and practices to ensure that we can attract and retain AI talent to the United States. So this is one area that actually there's, there's been an, an, a lot of great efforts that have been coming out of the current administration for increasing our domestic innovation and capabilities. However, there needs to be more that's done to address the scarcity of talent. Do any of our other panelists want to add anything? That's a great, pretty comprehensive strategy. Camille? I'll just add that I think that there are also some creative opportunities that could facilitate advancing some of the other goals we've talked about tech exchange or yeah, talent exchanges with tech companies um, would be a great opportunity to not only get talent from the technology sector into government and vice versa, but it would facilitate the trust that we have been talking about underpinning this collaborative relationship that we need. Um, you know, if we look at countries like Israel, part of why there's such a great relationship with their private sector and their academic sector and industry, I mean, in government is that everyone served in government. There's a, an inherent understanding of what government is trying to do, what the mission space is and, and how people operate. And we don't have that same model and you know, nor am I saying that we need to, but what I am saying is this is an opportunity 
for that kind of visibility and understanding that could facilitate trust. As we see more people traverse between the technology sector and government, we're seeing more of that develop, more programs spurring discussion and innovation and conversation about these things. But that kind of mutual understanding around technology um, and how it plans to develop in the private sector, but also national security pro uh, priorities and capacity building priorities um, could support some of the other things we're talking about. Great, Sana? So I think these are great points. Just to add that trust also works in another way. We should also build trust between the people that are using the systems and the people and the system themselves. And I think this is a question of bringing the users into the conversations about the development of this emerging technology. And in addition to that, given that technology is so is, is a product of our society, I think multidisciplinarity is also key in development of technology. Um, getting the sociologists and the political scientists in on these questions is important. Um, because they have such big com um, implications for international cooperation and competition. Yeah, great. Jenny, did you want to jump in on this? I mean, I would echo pretty much everything that was just said um, with a, with maybe a foot stomp or extra emphasis on the, um, the education at the K through 12 level um, across the country, making sure that we are really reaching out to people who are typically not exposed to computer science, um, not exposed to some of the the STEM activities that we um, that we have in some of the bigger cities or in other populations, um, in order to especially inform our future technologies, emerging technologies like AI, we really need a diversity in perspective and diversity in background um, and just diversity generally. And so I think you really build that pipeline by starting at the at the base level with kindergarten through through a through middle school and on all the way up um, to ensure that more people have access to that kind of technology and skills. Yeah, so I will I will uh, um, beat this dead horse again about civics education uh, because I, I think it's so relevant, Ginny, to what you've just said. You know, your uh, your boss, Brad Smith, uh, who who uh, I was fortunate enough to have an opportunity to chat with um, about these issues, made the point that uh, these as we teach these uh, you know STEM uh, subjects particularly the technology piece, we have to also instill a sense of civic responsibility. And, uh, and so that, that K through 12 uh, focus on STEM needs to be broadened so that we build in civics. Uh, I think uh, that cybersecurity ought to be a use case for every civics teacher to talk about civic responsibility, right? What is our, what is our responsibility? beyond just ourselves, why we should you know, exercise more care. And certainly as we're tr educating the next generation of innovators in technology, what is their obligation, right, to society? What, you know, do they have a, a broader way of thinking about what they're doing and the implications uh, for society? And I think that comes from that basic grounding in, in civic identity and civic responsibility. Sana, did you um, have your hand up from earlier or did you want to add something more here or from earlier? Okay. Um, and it's interesting when you talk about broadening the conversation uh, uh, to include, you know, uh, users, for example, at the table, um, but also developers, right? So we did, we got a question along those lines, you know, um, Abby asks, we encourage tech workers to help educate policymakers, but we also criticize self-regulation at tech companies as insufficient. Uh, how do you navigate this tension and ensure the right stakeholders are shaping tech policies for the US government? Um, and, and then how should tech workers and companies navigate dual use technologies? Um, can you develop technology for the U.S. military and ensure it won't be used for lethal purposes? Um, so, you know, two really good questions from Abby. If, does anybody want to take a stab at the first one about, you know, how do we, uh, what, what is the right, and we've touched on this a little bit in terms of how we're organized, what is the right way to bring tech companies into the conversation with policymakers? to both educate policymakers and for policymakers to help educate the tech companies on what our expectations of them are and should be. 
Well, one thought that I have when I when I heard this is, um, you know, there are some really great opportunities for people who work in tech to have exposure to working in government without it necessarily being a long term career shift. And I think that's something that is fairly recent. I think we really first saw that starting in the Obama administration with some great work with the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program. Um, and some other ways, I think there's Tech Congress as well, if people want to go to the Hill and spend a year or two. Um, and I love the idea that this is sort of Peace Corps for the tech, you know, it's your way of giving back, of spending some time, doing some service with the government, and then having the opportunity to go back to your to your company or to, to you know, whatever else you want to do after the fact. Um, the more that people sort of sign up and volunteer, uh, not necessarily volunteer, but choose to spend a couple of years doing that, I think that will have a huge impact on how our government looks at tech when they have people who are coming from the technology industry and are really um, sort of living and breathing the policy piece. But then also, man, when those people, if and when they go back, um, though I know a lot of people who have chosen to stay in government uh, because they love the service once they go, but for those who choose to, to come back, they are then bringing with them um, some really invaluable knowledge about how the policy making process works and they're a huge asset to their companies. Um, it's one of the reasons that Microsoft offers civic leave for our employees. Um, so if they want to go do that for a year or two, they can do that and have a spot when they come back because we recognize it is in everybody's best interest for our folks to go and serve and spend a couple a couple years or so working in government. So I know that doesn't maybe get to sort of the question of the tension, but I do think it's one sort of positive development that we've seen over the years that that could um, could really help the two worlds sort of bridge that gap and understand each other better. Yeah, it's it's almost like a joint duty in the military, right? To try to build understanding across the services uh, within the military to build that understanding between government and private sector and. Um, I remember years ago being on the stage at the Aspen Security Forum uh, uh, with the head of Intel at the time, and uh, who was talking about how what a challenge it is to to you know find good cyber talent. And I turned to him, I said, "You think you're having trouble? Imagine if you're just work you know in the government trying to uh, find cyber talent." I said, "You know, private sector always comes to me and says, what are you doing, government, to build the pipeline?" And I finally turned it around uh, and said, so what are you doing at Intel to build the pipeline? Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. If you share, you know, uh, in, for example, providing a scholarship uh, for students into computer science, I'll take them right out of school for two or three years. I'll give them the on the job training and then hand them over to you. Cause you know, a lot of them are gonna go to you anyway, <laughs> once they have the skills. Um, and and so they can work for you. You get somebody who's got some training, and I believe a good number of them will come back to me. This is when I was in the government because they missed the mission, um, as you talked about, Jenny, uh, and uh, and we shook on it. And Jim Langevin, uh, congressman from Rhode Island, um, has uh, has been actually been working on these kinds of creative ways to encourage this flow between the private sector and government. Um, one of you also talked about this, the Reserve Corps, which I think is a great idea the, um, and, and can accomplish much of the same kind of objective of, of that mutual understanding that we need in order to mobilize cohesively when needed um, to understand each other's capabilities and imperatives and limitations. Um, my only worry is if we rely on the Reserve Corps for response, uh, because I think we'll be double counting these are people who are uh, valued because of their day jobs for private sector companies where they perform important functions. And if we have a wide scale event, they're gonna be needed perhaps at their companies and the government is gonna think they can call on them. And um, so we just have to be careful not to double count. But um, but otherwise I think there's a lot lot to be said about that. Christy, did you wanna weigh in on this? Yeah, yeah great. No, I think that um, your point is an excellent one in that it really, and it, it goes back to a point that you made about the report about how it is helping educate policymakers and the public. And truly, I do think that a large part of some of the disconnect can be just a, a asymmetric information. So it's really about how can the government share information to the private sector to help them understand some of the threats, to help understand maybe what the, even the needs are for, for example, the Department of Defense in terms of what sort of capabilities they would like, um, what the commercial gaps may be. And on the other side, for a private sector to help um, 
provide sort of firsthand experience about what it means to be, for example, at an international technical standards body and, uh, ha- and participate in those meetings. So that's why a lot of our recommendations have been about how can we ensure and how can the United States government reorganize and have the structures and interagency uh, coordination to bring in the private sector for these conversations about technical standards, for domestic innovation, for ensuring that we have the right hardware and semiconductors and chips. And we're looking at responsible use and applications um, so that AI enabled technologies are not helping other governments surveil and suppress uh, civil dissent in their country. Um, And another part of, of addressing that gap is what the commission has recommended, which is an emerging technology coalition, which would convene nations, like-minded nations and democracies, traditional allies and partners and, and uh, new allies and partners with the civil society, with the private sector to really address um, challenges and opportunities uh, proposed by artificial intelligence and emerging technologies, including on regulation, and including um, ensuring that the United States regulatory regimes may align with allies and partners regulatory regimes so that we can strengthen international collaboration or strengthen R&D um, and not, not undercut or undermine the sort of collaboration that's really needed to advance democratic uses of artificial intelligence and emerging technologies. Yeah. And some of those conversations may be about where we are going to uh, count on our partner or ally country to take the lead in something. Um, and we will not, you know, we will we will pursue some complementary, uh, you know, avenue. Maybe it's the, the applications of that technology that, you know, um, and so it really is kind of a give and take and a recognition of relative strengths and competitive advantages um, that we're talking about there. Sana, did you want to jump in on this? Um, sure. So I think this is a fascinating conversation. So I think I, I think we also should note that we don't want to develop um, everything, right? There should be limits. And those limits are not only f- on the basis of ethical concerns, like we see in the debates around lethal autonomous weapons, even though I should note that um, we when we do these kinds of conversations, we want to focus on the, the sets of technologies that are already here, rather than just like looking in the future, you want to also capture what already exists, um, as well as utilize some of the um, organizations and networks and um, platforms and legal frameworks that already exist, like I think about the Geneva Conventions and that kind of stuff. Um, but I also think we want to be careful about limitless, limitless technology from a strategic point of view. Because if we think um, about something that I study uh, in depth, which is missile defense, I think the, the idea that there is um, that there appears to be no real limits on the amount of development we do in missile defense can be incredibly upsetting um, for adversaries and leads to an arms race dynamic. So I think we want to be really, really careful and, and find ways to clearly signal uh, limits in technological development as well. Great. Um, so some might see that as a somewhat provocative statement that we sh- that there are th- things we should not pursue. Does anybody want to challenge that statement or? I guess I'll take the bait. Um, there, I do think that there are things that the United States and you know the Commission recommends that there are certain things that the United States should not pursue. However, I think that we need to be clear-eyed about the fact that our competitors may be pursuing things that we would wish they would not pursue. And we need to understand that if we want to shape the norms or the use around how some of these uh, technologies are applied, um, sometimes that means that we will maybe have to pursue and be involved with things out of necessity. Um, Otherwise we'll be uh, sort of letting our competitors shape the global landscape in a way that Uh, undermines democratic societies in a free and and open uh, international order. Great, really important point, Christy, thank you. Um, And and Sana uh, has emphasized a couple times now that we, you know, we can't be so focused, although this panel is focused on emerging technologies, but that, you know, sometimes uh, what, uh, what a lot of policymakers think is an emerging technology is something that's actually been around for quite some time. Uh, and Sana, I think you and Ginny and others have made this point as well, and that we it's really important that we 
uh, not lose sight of what is right in front of us, both in terms of the technologies and the policies and laws that we have in place and how those would apply before we immediately start reaching for something new. So we've got a couple questions about kind of existing uh, technologies, but that you know will uh, uh, that that can be implicated, uh, affected by emerging technologies to become more complex. And one of those is disinformation. So, we've got uh, John from NATO Strategic Communications Center of Excellence who's asking, what are the knowledge gaps and what we know about dis and misinformation, and what needs to be studied more to provide policymakers with better recommendations? And Jenny, maybe this is something that's right up your alley. Sure, um, I can definitely start to address the gaps. Um, the solutions part, the recommendations is um, no question more challenging. Um, one of the things that I think about as one of the biggest challenges when you're talking about dis and misinformation is essentially the um, asymmetric challenge involved. Es essentially, you're talking about um, predicting when and where disinformation is going to achieve virality um, when most of the time the countermeasures that you see are reactive, right? The, the things that people have put in place to respond to disinformation is in fact responding to it versus um, in many cases being able to catch it on the front end or stop it before it occurs. So we think a lot about those issues and about how we can sort of balance out that asymmetric threat um, of disinformation campaigns. Um, and then of course, there's just the ongoing challenge of defining disinformation to begin with, um, who is the arbiter of truth, who gets to define define what, um, and then how do you apply it? And are we talking about applications from the platforms? Or are we talking about applications through regulation, which I get is sort of what the question is getting at. So as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm all full of, of problems and questions. Um, the recommendations and solutions part is something that a lot of people are grappling with and, and struggling. Um, I'll say one area that we've sort of been focusing in on is, is around um, not disinformation as a general topic, but more specifically around like synthetic media and deep fakes and essentially what can be done to help identify the truth, the reality. Um, this is a problem that has not yet actually become a huge issue in political um, uh, issues yet, but it is absolutely an issue for a lot of very vulnerable people, particularly women um, around pornography. So we see deep fakes as being something that will um, continue to emerge and be problematic. So a lot of investigation right now into origin of, of media and um, essentially how can you create uh, something that can be watermarked for, that's not the appropriate term, but just to give you a sense of what, what people are investigating right now, how can you essentially watermark a video um, so that you know where it originally came from, you know that the origin is authentic. Um, so there are some solutions out there. I guess I'm trying to put some silver lining on this. There are people who are working really hard to identify um, solutions in this space, but it is certainly one that is, is full of more questions at this point than answers. Yeah, it is a challenge. And, you know, one of the things with regard to the deep fakes, um, you know, the solution sets that you're talking about that folks are working on, the more you can do it in real time, as opposed to after the fact debunking something, my biggest is is going to be really important. My biggest worry about deep fakes is less that people will be convinced of the truth of the deep fake than that they will stop believing in or trusting anything that they see because they don't know whether it's a uh, fake or real anymore. And that again moves us toward that post truth world. Uh, and disinformation is really it, it often designed to do just that. Uh, and you, you know, Ginny, you talk about getting out in front of not just being reactive to disinformation and misinformation. I will just this, and I maybe this will be the last time I'll mention civics education. Maybe not, uh, but I, but again, I think it is an important way to build public resilience against disinformation, which is designed to get people to disengage, to give up, to think they can't, you know, that democracy is not worth staying engaged in because the system is so irrevocably broken. If we can teach people, empower people to be effective agents of change, to hold government accountable, we can uh, build public resilience against the content of disinformation instead of just the technique of disinformation. Camille, did you have your hand up for this? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's really important to, um, to, to focus on the root causes that we're trying to solve too. And in the disinformation problem, I think a lot of what we see is flurry around the manifestation of the moment and the technology of the moment. 
Um, and Jenny brings up really good examples of how we can combat this, but what we really need are some cultural shifts. Um, some spurred by the civics education that you were talking about, but also um, if we shift how we think about what truthfulness looks like and what we as um, industry do to spur that truth, we can leverage the collaboration we've been talking about in industry standards bodies, in industry groups in general, to spur a uniform response that says, okay, well, the standard will be that our cell phones and other camera devices will inherently stamp things that are true, right? And then we can mitigate for pictures of pictures and you know, fake manipulated audio in a way that supports that civics education that taught you to be you know, politely paranoid, but understand how to find your truth for yourself, right? And so there are some opportunities through the collaboration we talked about to facilitate addressing root causes and spurring cultural change that can support some of the technical solutions that we are exploring as industry and government. The other thing I wanted to uh, add to the conversation earlier about the tension is we have to identify that tension. We have to talk about that tension because ignoring the tension between the demands that we're making on industry will make trust a harder proposition. Um, if we don't facilitate collaboration and cooperation that is rooted in acknowledging the hard problems we're seeking to solve, we won't make any progress. So I just wanted to throw that out there too. Yeah, yeah, great. I love the um, politely paranoid, Camille. Uh, I, one of my favorite lines from a movie a long, long time ago is, you know, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean everybody isn't out to get you. Um, uh, I think paranoia is an occupational hazard for all of us in national security. But I also really appreciated your discussion of technology as part of the solution set, right? Because we tend to focus a lot on te uh, technology as a challenge, but uh, but but clearly can help us in some interesting ways. And we have a question along those lines, which I thought was interesting. Um, I, I, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing the name, uh, Sneha from Johns Hopkins, SAIS, uh, ask, what potential and how do you see the future of technology shaping language acquisition and language learning? <coughs> Does anybody? Sorry about that. Does anybody have uh, insights into that? Thoughts on where that might be going? Ginny, is that anything Microsoft is looking at? Probably, <laughs> but not me. <laughs> I think Christy came off mute. I think she might have some thoughts on it. Excellent. I, I don't think I, I don't have a, a lot of thoughts on it, but I will just say that's a, uh, the commission, I did identify uh, a number of places where we think that AI will truly revolutionize and benefit humanity. Um, it's really innumerable, but one of them is on uh, lifelong learning and personalized education. And I think that uh, language ac acquisition and language learning is, is an area where uh, artificial intelligence can really help push the forefront. Um, and we're really positive about the, the ability for the United States and also in collaboration with allies and partners to work on pushing that forward um, to address maybe some of even the AI talent and emerging technology talent gaps by uh, through personalized learning. Yeah. That quite answers it. Yeah, that's great, Christy. Um, I think there is some real value in learning other languages beyond just the ability to speak and understand other languages. I think there is some some value in re, kind of rewiring your brain. There's some cultural um, understanding that comes with really learning a new language. That having been said, I will say one of the things I am most excited about the potential from technology is those, you know, those things, those little buds you'd put in your ears and suddenly you can uh, understand whatever anybody's saying to you in whatever language and, you know, whatever technology might allow me then to respond and have that conversation in their language without having to learn all those languages. Um, <laughs> We have a question from uh, Luis, also at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, Applied Physics Laboratory, who asks, uh, why should a 22-year-old freshly minted graduate work for the government uh, when that graduate can make $200,000 a year working for a private security group? Um, so uh, Luis is pointing out the pay challenge, um, but uh, Jenny and Camille, particularly, you guys have spoken to and seen firsthand 
that the government can, in fact, compete for talent. And why is that? Yeah, I mean, the government is the only place you can look at these issues um, from that lens. I mean, the opportunity to look at offensive capabilities as compared to defensive and to understand the full breadth of the federal apparatus and how that mobilizes around a cyber incident um, and how you know the federal government is thinking about local issues versus national issues and international issues and how all those converge is not compared to how you're looking at these things in industry. Don't get me wrong, industry is definitely a part of national security and foreign policy discussions and how we are moving today, right? But it is a different lens, different capabilities, different opportunities. And so that 22 year old, I would challenge them while they are still able to live with roommates and, you know, think about life a little differently, be a little more scrappy about their finances, that getting a basis in the government where you are tackling these issues through this national security lens um, and understanding the federal apparatus and the world around you is a great toolkit to bring with you to the private sector, should you choose to do that, or to move seamlessly between the two. And we need more people who do that. So there's a value proposition. There's a real tie to mission and a, a look at these issues in a way that you, is unmatched in the industry. I'll just add, when I talk to um, college students who are trying to figure out what they do next, um, it, sometimes government is a strategic move too. Um, you know, I it would depend on the individual. And there might be cases where I would look at someone's profile and what they wanted to do long term. And I'd say, yeah, student in government's not really all that helpful for you. You should, you know, go this path. But a lot of times, depending on what they think they want to do, what their skill set is, I wouldn't say that the pay differential for those first couple of years tends to be great enough. Um, when they, if they're thinking long term, and that's why mentorship is really important for a lot of these students, having people they can talk to who will help them see what might be around the corner, because it's really hard not to see past that first paycheck, especially if you've been on, you know, student aid and you're like looking forward to finally making money and you're turning down this great opportunity. But if you have someone who's sort of in your corner and talking to you and able to advocate for you and say, look, you actually have the potential to make far more if you just give yourself a few years in government, the skill set you'll develop there on top of your technical skill set will translate to a much bigger, better deal for you in the long run. Um, so it's, I think it's sort of a combination of things. It really doesn't depend on the individual, but I think there are, there's compelling cases to be made for even for self-interest in that case. Well, uh, Sana and Christy, you both are much closer to this. Uh, so what is your thinking as, as uh, about to be a new uh, postgraduate students or postgraduates? Yeah, Sana. Um, so I think um, I'd like to make a, a pin for the academic world in this conversation as well. I think there's work to be done uh, in academia in, for example, thinking about misinformation and this kind of stuff. Um, and I think it's important that that academia um, interacts more with the outside world and with what everyone else is doing. And I think policy relevant research is definitely um, some an important discussion that's ongoing, but need to be expanded within the academic realm um, in order to solve these um, extremely complex um, technological development questions. Um, so that's kind of my pin. Um, yeah. Great. So, so it's not just between the private sector, business and government. You're making the pitch for academia. Christy. I mean, I think that Camille and Jenny and Sana all just hit it on the nose that it really is about sort of the mission and what you're able to do when, when you're in government and uh, the ability to see really the full picture uh, is just unparalleled. Um, so nothing more I could really add that they, that they haven't already uh, really explained very well. Yeah. Well, I would certainly foot stomp that. Uh, as I said, I, I've i just seen so many times when people spent some time in government, uh, left to make some money to put their kids through college, but as soon as they could, uh, were anxious to get back in because that sense of mission is really very hard to replicate anywhere else. I mean, I, uh, you know, Ginny and Camille both have alluded to the very public service kinds of activities that they've been able to engage in in their private sector positions, um, particularly around elections and disinformation and those kinds of things. But it is, as Chrissy says, that comprehensive view uh, and that, you know, kind of really strong sense of this really being all about the mission 
uh, and a part of something that's larger than yourself, right, is really the joy of working for government. So I hope all of you soon to be graduates out there who are watching this will uh, think hard about going into government and particularly DHS, I'm gonna put in a plug for CISA um, as the moderator's prerogative. Uh, so we have, we have come to the end of our time, uh, but it was a great conversation, really just thoroughly enjoyed talking with all four of you. And I wanna thank you. I know you're all very busy for taking time to be with us. And thank you to all of you who are watching this. And I wanna encourage you, the Future Strategy Forum is not over. Uh, the next panel will be live at three o'clock today. It is on te uh, technology in a changing international landscape. Uh, and it will be a discussion with the Jan Nolan Prize uh, winners. So that should be a great conversation. And uh, I hope all of you will, will sign in. And thank you again. Thanks, everybody. Hello, I am Frank Gavin, the director of the Henry A. Kissinger Center for Global Affairs at SAIS Johns Hopkins. I'm very proud to introduce the next panel, the Jan Nolan uh, Award Prize winners. It's impossible in a few minutes to describe the profound impact that Jan Nolan had on the lives of countless people. She was a terrific scholar, great consequence that helped shape the most important policy debates about nuclear weapons and other issues. More than that, however, she was an amazing person. She was, to use a word we don't use very often, a mensch, someone of enormous integrity, intelligence, warmth, kindness, and humor. Like all of her friends, I miss her enormously. When the Kissinger Center and CSIS and Texas National Security Review were trying to decide the very best way to honor her extraordinary legacy, we kicked around a number of ideas. After much discussion, including the idea of inventing a new cocktail in her honor, we decided to create a new prize that honored emerging scholars generating big ideas. Jan was all about mentorship, all about new voices, and all about taking big swings at important issues. And we wanted to reward those who followed in her path. Um, the three scholars you're gonna hear from today was very, very difficult. I wanna thank the committee that helped us select the winners. It was a great group. Kath Hicks, Jim Steinberg, Corey Shockey, Karen Yarhi Milo, and Doyle Hodges, um, who did an extraordinary amount of work uh, helping us narrow down to get to these three. Each of the winners also got to select a star prize commentator. Uh, and I wanna thank Thomas Ribb, Amy Ziegert, and Daniel Bessner um, for participating in that process. Their comments were particularly helpful. And I especially wanna thank Ryan Evans, the creator and publisher of the Texas National Security Review for his incredible support and vision. I know he misses Jan every day as much as I do. These papers will appear in a special edition of the Texas National Security Review in the fall. And uh, we at the Kissinger Center and CSIS are just cannot wait to see them. I'm now quite pleased to turn things over to Rachel Teacott, an MIT PhD student and co-creator of the Future Strategy Forum and a rising star who is very much in the Jan Nolan tradition of uh, great emerging voices and mensch-like people. So Rachel, without further ado, over to you. Thank you so much, Frank. Uh, I'm Rachel Teacott. I am a PhD candidate at MIT and a soon to be assistant professor at the Naval War College. Um, my current research focuses on the US military's approach to building and cooperating with partner militaries. More broadly, I research US military strategy and operations and civil military relations. I'm also, as Frank mentioned, a co-founder of the Future Strategy Forum. And I'm thrilled to welcome you all back to Future Strategy Forum 2021 for a panel with the winners of the Jan Nolan Prize. So each of these panelists wrote fascinating, stimulating papers and gave us a lot of material to work with today. Uh, so first things first, introductions. So we have Dr. Jane Vainman, an assistant professor in political science at Temple University, where her research focuses on security cooperation between adversarial states, the design of arms control agreements, and the effects of emerging technology on international institutions. She's a PhD in government from Harvard University. We have Dr. John Emery, a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow at Stanford University, who will be joining the University of Oklahoma as an assistant professor in the fall. So his research examines national security, the ethics of war and peace, and technological innovation. And he got his PhD in political science from the UC Irvine. 
We also have with us Ms. Sahar Noman, a Principal Threat Intelligence Analyst at BAE Systems Applied Intelligence, where she researches state-sponsored cyber espionage with a focus on the Middle East and specializes in the intersection of geopolitics and cyber operations. Sahar received her master's degree in, inter in intelligence and international security from the Department of War Studies at King's College London. And I believe she's joining us from London today. So thank you very much, Sahar, for staying up late for us this evening. Um, so before we dive into questions, I just wanted to remind all of our viewers that there will be an opportunity at the end of the panel for questions from all of you. So please write your questions for the panelists in the Google form, which you can access on the CSAS Future Strategy Forum website event page or the Future Strategy Forum website, futurestrategyforum.com. Um, okay, so now I'd like to just begin the show by asking each of you to summarize your projects, give us the elevator pitch. Um, so I'll start with Jane and then go to John and then Sahar. Great, thank you. Um, I'm so excited to be part of this conference. In prior years, I've loved watching this conference and all the panels, so it's really quite an honor uh, to be part of it this year. So my research um, looks at how emerging technology affects prospects for arms control. And rather than efforts to control or govern emerging technologies themselves, such as you know, agreements to limit cyber weapons, I was interested in thinking about how emerging technologies might be incorporated into monitoring and information gathering and how that will affect prospects for international cooperation on existing capabilities. So technologies such as small satellites and artificial intelligence affect the amount of information collected or the ease of information processing, all of which is pretty important for a state that might be worried about violations on a deal. Now, the intuition, and I think this is sort of currently the dominant policy narrative, um, it suggests that technologies which improve monitoring should make arms control easier to achieve. I argue that this is not the case, or at least not entirely the case. In an agreement, states face a trade-off between the beneficial and adverse aspects of information. So states need transparency uh, in order to observe behavior and gain some assurance that everyone is complying with an agreement. But at the same time, they need secrecy because revealing too much might allow other states to gain military advantages. The nature of a monitoring technology can directly affect this trade-off between transparency and security. Um, so I think there's three uh, key factors we should use in uh, to assess the potential impact of any particular emerging technology. First, we should be looking at how it affects uh, unilateral monitoring capabilities. Second, the degree to which a technology allows states to have demonstrable control over exactly how much information is uh, collected in the process of agreement monitoring. And finally, uh, the effect that a technology might have on concealment. And together, these factors provide um, a systematic and generalizable analytic framework that can be applied to assessing uh, emerging technologies. And so in my work, I um, sort of uh, developed this framework and actually then try to use it to assess um, a number of technologies, satellites, drones, AI, and additive manufacturing. And I come away with some preliminary assessments I'm generally optimistic about the effects of emerging technology on unilateral monitoring and how that will maybe make cooperation easier. Um, but options for using emerging tech in more intrusive monitoring, such as inspections or remote observation, um, this is likely, I think, to create uh, risks of, for security. And doing so may make states actually more uh, hesitant to sign agreements in the first place. I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Jane. John, jump right in. Uh, thank you so much. It's really an honor to be the recipient of such a prestigious award in honor of Jen Nolan. So I just feel truly, truly humbled and blessed by this experience. So my project looks at early political military wargaming at the Rand Corporation in the 1950s. And I was kind of really inspired by Carol Cohn's work, Sex and Death in the Rational World of the Defense Intellectual uh, from 1987, where she did this kind of famous participant observation of nuclear deterrence theorists. And she talked a lot about how these deterrence theorists would use a techno-strategic language, which was a language filled with abstraction, euphemism, that humanizes insentient weapons and excludes human suffering from this kind of inherently gendered world that nuclear theorists construct as the parameters of legitimate debate. And so you live in this abstract world where you can casually discuss 
killing millions of people with nuclear weapons with no sense of horror and urgency. So with that kind of drive, I went to the Rand Corporation archives expecting to find that in the early 1950s. I kind of wanted to find the origin stories of those thinkers that laid the foundation of the entire kind of Cold War intellectual landscape to see about how they thought about and grappled with this world of new technologies of nuclear weapons and an unknown future of war. While I went in expecting to find a lot of Dr. Strange loves, what I found in instead was a lot of kind of ethical reflection and a lot of deep thought about these kind of issues and the morality of this. So it wasn't necessarily this kind of uh, groupthink at Rand Corporation, but a huge contestation of ideas. And this really played out kind of most prominently between the mathematics division and the social sciences division. So what I do in the article is I offer a comparative analysis of the two Cold War games that these divergent divisions created. They took different epistemological outlooks and approaches to the world and had vastly different outcomes in their game. And so this Cold War game is kind of the origin story of political military gaming that Reed Polly especially focus on, focuses on in his 2018 international security article at MIT. So understanding this origin story um, provides some useful insights into kind of the dilemmas of technology, wargaming, and the future of war. And so it's interesting from the mathematical division's perspective, they wanted to integrate politics and economics into traditional wargaming. They wanted to quantify psychologies in order to predict Cold War strategies and their consequences. The social sciences division, in contrast, thought that the mathematicians were stepping on their territory a little bit too much and that they were doing bad science. And so as historian Daniel Bessner argues, the social sciences division of the Cold War game endorsed the idea that political life by definition was unquantifiable. It didn't mean they rejected rationalism, but instead they argued that by reproducing the irrational dynamism of international politics in this war game was a more useful heuristic and more scientific than the mathematician's war game model to understand the world. And what I really liked about this social science game was that they took uncertainty very seriously. They understood the exercise of judgment in international politics. And so the Cold War game of the social science division would rely on players' qualitative knowledge about a given nation's politics, culture, society, on their history, on the psychology of individuals and group dynamics to more accurately represent what a nuclear standoff may look like. And what we had here in the kind of crux of the argument was that we had very divergent and. Uh, outcomes. The mathematicians were quickly hurling hydrogen bombs around, calculating mass casualties, the effect on GDP that hydrogen bombs would have, etc. Whereas the social scientists had a real kind of restraint and inability to cross that nuclear threshold. And the game historian noted that the players quickly gained a sense of the awful consequences that result from an ill-advised move. And those who in the classroom and their publications advocated for bold imaginative policies and criticized free world leaders for their timidity usually found themselves behaving with equal caution when they assumed the burden of policymaking in the game. So participants thus tended to judge foreign policy decisions in the real world differently after having played the game. So what I find the interesting puzzle to kind of close out is that they both engaged what, what Carol, with what Carol Cohn would call techno-strategic language, but the social scientists with their kind of high degree of realism engaged this kind of emotional intelligence and ethical practical judgment that resulted in nuclear strain. So in the end, even though they didn't use moral language, they made moral choices. And so this kind of exploration of this proliferation of the social science Cold War game, I think, has interesting parallels to the dilemmas we're facing today. Go ahead, Sahar. Hi. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, thank you for the to the Future S uh, Strategy Forum for having me, and it's an honor to uh, be a winner of the Jan Nolan Prize, and I'm uh, very honored to participate in her legacy in, in this small way. Um, my paper is about, uh, more broadly, the encryption debate, and I use the Apple versus FBI case study uh, for the case from 2016, uh, which is basically analyzed and situated in the broader context of uh, encryption and exceptional access. So generally, uh, for the last couple decades, law enforcement has made claims of going dark, uh, which means losing access to suspect communications. 
Um, their response to this is to design, uh, request the design uh, um, and implementation of exceptional access mechanisms um, into communications infrastructure. Now, exceptional access means that uh, there be a mechanism to subvert the given purposes of a communication system um, so that a third party can access it without the consent of a user. So this debate, this encryption debate, has been going on for several years and is, is lovingly called the crypto wars. Uh, so I kind of take a look at the history of the crypto wars, uh, how encryption has spread and become quite ubiqu ubiquitous in society, um, and then talk about kind of the... Um, technical, legal, and political aspects of this case and the broader debate. So technically, uh, I, I look at how exceptional access mechanisms are um, vulnerabilities introduced into software uh, or communication systems that actually weaken the security of the systems themselves. Um, legally, I kind of look at the justifications for um, uh, uh, kind of inserting those mechanisms into the communications infrastructure. Uh, and vice versa for not doing so. Um, and kind of politically, I look at the relationship between uh, users, private companies, and the government, uh, and see kind of what the responsibilities um, and, and kind of trust uh, relationships are between them. So really, I'm trying to answer the question uh, about whether exceptional access to counter device encryption um, is damaging to national security. So in the case of Apple F versus FBI, um, there was a shooter in San Bernardino and the FBI needed to get into his iPhone. The iPhone was encrypted as per Apple's design of those products. So they requested that Apple help them get into the phone by creating a flawed uh, software update uh, that would allow them to access it. Now, Apple refused on kind of security and privacy grounds. Uh, the case went to court, although there was never a ruling uh, because the FBI found a third party to access the phone for them. So that's it's a quite interesting case in that there wasn't a precedent set, uh, but if there had been, it would have been pretty significant for the encryption debate. And so um, uh, as a lot of people kind of have weighed in about this case and uh, encryption and exceptional access, uh, many think the, the debate shouldn't be settled in court uh, and should rather be settled in Congress. Uh, so really, I explored this case from a, a few different perspectives and, and kind of look at what, um, you know, critiquing the security versus privacy debate actually means. And does this case represent that or is it more security versus security? Um, and I try to um, uh, bring a little bit of the, the policy angle to it as well. There's been a couple laws in the last couple of years that have been introduced or, or acts rather um, that have been introduced in Congress to regulate uh, encryption, which has also played into this debate quite a lot. So um, uh, I kind of conclude with uh, a more complicated answer than yes, it is damaging to national security. Um, but the paper is basically an exploration of this uh, this particular issue and kind of this this iteration of it uh, as it was demonstrated in Apple versus FBI. Thanks so much to each of you. So clearly three very different projects that all touch on very different dimensions of kind of the, the subject of this conference this year, which is emerging technology and national security. Different as they are though, there are some strands that we've that we've across them. So I wanted to pick up on, on, um, on this myth busting element that both Sahar's project and Jane's project uh, share. So um, you both talk about a myth that emerging technologies that help to increase transparency will necessarily enhance security. So you gave us a little bit of that in your summary, but can you expand a little bit on this myth? Like what is this myth? Why is it wrong? Um, and yeah, so I'll go to Sahar first and then to Jane. Sure. So it is kind of an interesting take. Uh, transparency is something that people would usually associate with being a good thing. Um, that's kind of the connotation. Uh, in, in my case, uh, the transparency really means increased visibility. So what law enforcement is asking for is a way to circumvent or bypass encryption, which would give them uh, the access that they're looking for to you know, criminals or other suspects uh, communications or devices. Um, which would, um, you know, theoretically help their cases and, uh, you know, increase their visibility and access to data. So the the paper really talks about how the um, the, the the dichotomy that they're proposing, which is uh, if you give up a little bit of your privacy uh, through, you know, allowing us to access these devices, then we can increase the security uh, for for the public. Now I, I kind of talk about this as a false dichotomy because. Security and privacy aren't actually mutually exclusive. They, they kind of go hand in hand. So if you're weakening encryption 
which in itself is based on kind of technical cryptographic principles where, um, you know, security is absolute security. You are kind of weakening uh, security and privacy, both, both for, for users of these, of these devices. Um, so it's really kind of looking at this marginal benefit for law enforcement while um, being detrimental to uh, society as a whole. Uh, and that's why I kind of, uh, how I explore this, uh, this false dichotomy. So I, I would definitely say that increased visibility in this case is, is um, actually a bad thing in that it um, uh, has kind of um, costs and implications um, that are more damaging uh, than the actual, the marginal benefit that it provides. Thanks. Um, so yeah, this is a really interesting um, parallel between our papers, um, even though they're seemingly on very different topics. And because I also sort of encountered this, this perception that like, oh, an arms control, more transparency is a good thing. We should have more transparency. Um, but arms control is a situation where actors have diverging interests in many respects. And yes, there are some mutual interests, such as you know, maybe not spending a ton of money building really expensive weapons. Um, and cooperation can happen under that condition. But it is also reasonable to expect that each side is still trying to gain an advantage over the other, even while they're cooperating. Now, the uh, relationship between monitoring and intelligence gathering and intelligence information is well known to arms control practitioners. Um, but I think it's often overlooked kind of in the public debate and also in the political science literature that looks at um, security institutions. So, and transparency is indeed good for compliance, uh, but it comes with costs. Um, and I think that a clearer understanding of those costs would make kind of certain situations make more sense in the sense that, for example, that some states would reject agreements, would continue to bear the costs of uh, sanctions and competition if they believe that accepting a deal would give perhaps the US a way to better attack them or better um, undermine their regime in the future. So in the sense, they sort of are avoiding creating a vulnerability through the agreement um, itself. And in terms of technology, sort of monitoring that allows for more effective espionage is essentially going to make the problem worse. It's going to sort of increase the um, vulnerability side, um, create even higher threats um, for, to security. So as we assess technology, we really need to think about sort of, does this technology make it easier or more difficult to draw the line between what is revealed and what is kept secret? And some technologies, I think, like um, AI, they could actually really blur that line. Um, so if information, for example, is collected do it during an inspection and is being integrated into analysis by some algorithm and combined with extra information, that's probably really good for being able to detect noncompliance. But um, as the monitored party, I don't know what your AI capabilities can do. I don't even know what small bits of detail information might be important to hide. And I fear that the small detail will enable your AI tools to uncover all these security vulnerabilities. Now, I might be wrong, um, but I don't wanna risk it. And maybe I won't gonna sign an agreement at all. I might be more likely to sign an agreement that actually uses tools that provide for less transparency. So in the sense, yes, transparency can be good uh, for, and technology sort of can be good for transparency, uh, but it's ultimately maybe not so good for getting a mutually acceptable deal. Thanks, so, so I wanna press on this question of how, how do we answer this question? How do we answer the question of how transparency will affect arms control? How emerging technologies will affect transparency and will then affect arms control? Um, given that, you know, stepping back, this is a conference about emerging technology and national security. So this is a very, very difficult set of issues to study um, for data classification reasons, for by virtue of the fact that the technology itself is emerging. And so we don't know a lot about it yet. 
Um, we're often studying hypothetical scenarios that haven't actually occurred. So you you have to deal with a really difficult set of questions, and we don't really have the luxury of saying, ah, oh, it's hard, so we won't study it, because these are questions that policymakers need to get into now. These are important questions for us to, to not kind of let slide by. So I want to ask Jane and John both how do you think about these questions of, um, of how you study these really difficult these really difficult questions. So let's start with Jane and then go to John. Sure, yeah, this is such an interesting question. Um, and right, because it's like not only is information about some of the de in emerging technologies that I'm interested in just you know, not available to me as an independent researcher, but it's also not available kind of in general because we don't know how it's going to be applied, right? And a lot of the things that I was looking at, I'm sort of, I'm kind of trying to think through how it could be applied to uh, agreement monitoring, not how that's actually happening right now. So I think that sort of my approach to this was, and how I, I think is one way to go about it at least, is kind of um, developing a process for how to think about it, right? Developing the set of questions and the set of criteria for doing an evaluation, even if the ultimate evaluation that you can do right now is still incomplete. So you can use it to start with what you have now, but then you're actually still able to use that sort of framework um, to assess new information as it comes in. And you can be able to tell whether new information kind of supports your initial assessments or actually turns them on their heads. Um, for example, I was trying to think through in this um, kind of the problem of spoofing in AI, which I was kind of trying to get my head around is essentially kind of how big of a problem is this, especially when it comes to, you know, these um, algorithms being used to sort of track weapons capabilities. Can you really spoof that? Um, and in considering these kinds of scenarios, I think what will be important is sort of assessing sort of which will be sort of easy, like which, how will the technology emerge into what will start to be easier, the spoofing side or the detecting spoofing side. Um, and I think that as that information becomes available or as it changes with technology over time, I'll be able to sort of essentially use the framework I've already developed to draw a conclusion or draw an implication um, from technological developments that continue to occur. At least that's, a, that's one approach that I've taken. I think there are multiple approaches to taking to sort of studying something where there is less information or no information available yet. Um, but I think that's, that's at least one approach that I've taken in this work. An improvement on a shrug approach. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I think Jane's uh, framework approach is is especially helpful in thinking through the, some of these dilemmas of emerging technologies. I think it's probably pretty obvious already I take a more historical approach. And so the thing I was most struck by kind of digging through the RAND archives and trying to get into their mindset and mentality was how much uh, their kind of early 1950s moment parallels a lot of the same dilemmas that we're facing today, right? You have this new kind of emerging technology with nuclear weapons. You have kind of no empirical basis. Thankfully, there's never been a nuclear exchange between superpowers. And you have new methods for studying it, right? The very kind of birth of mathematics game theory. And already in 1954, they're talking about utilizing computers to solve a lot of these dilemmas, right? So even though you know technology has exploded today, I think there's a lot of useful parallels there for thinking about emerging tech, AI, and the kind of methods we use to study the world. And I think the way we get history wrong a lot of times is that we have the benefit of hindsight. Right? We know the outcome, what happened. And what we miss there is when we draw these kind of causal processes is we miss the contestation and the uncertainty kind of inherent in those moments. And so what I really like about the social sciences division at Rand Corporation in the 50s is that they really wanted to highlight this uncertainty. You know, figures like Machiavelli have called it Fortuna. We talk about the fog of war, some say chance, et cetera. But how do you really grapple with that for this kind of unknown future of war? Um, Joseph Goldson, one of the designers of the game, said that no government is absolutely free to impose its will on the world. All operate under some constraints and all must operate with incomplete information about the present and the future. And all must expect the unexpected to interfere with their best laid plans. 
world political history is replete with examples of Pyrrhic victories, and conversely, with situations thought to be defeats at the time, which turned out to be blessings in disguise. How to allow for such considerations in evaluating real or game-simulated political developments is a formidable problem indeed. Right, so I think that kind of captures this moment really, really nicely. And the way they tackled it in this game was they created something called the Committee on Nature to kind of interfere with the players of the game. And the role of nature was to provide for events um, that happen in the real world that are not under control of any government. Things like technological developments, death of important people, non-governmental political action, famines, popular disturbances, etc. So you had this nature committee that was essentially interfering with the kind of structure of the play of the game, the, ra the, the way that the kind of real world comes at you. So for them, it posed this vital function, since without it, reality would be reduced to kind of government-initiated action. So I really like the framework that they used to tackle Tackle this, and I think wargaming offers us one of those uh, one of those ways to kind of think through the dilemmas of emerging tech in kind of really serious and scientific ways. So, John, I wanted to pick up on this point of this wargaming and go a little bit deeper on this. Uh, so you took us back to wargaming at RAND in the 1950s, um, and we're going to close Future Strategy Forum tomorrow with Dr. Jackie Schneider's virtual wargame, which ex examines the implications of new technologies for deterrence, crisis stability, and escalation. Um, and there's been some something of uh, what people are calling a wargaming renaissance going on in DOD and academia. So can you just tell us a little bit more about how you think about wargames as a method for research and for policy? Sure, yeah, I'm really happy to be uh, kind of working on this at a time where there happens to be a renaissance. It wasn't something I had kind of predicted at the time doing the more kind of historical work, but it's really exciting to be a part of. And I think wargaming offers us a lot of ways to kind of tackle these these dilemmas and not necessarily solve the problems, but to help us raise the right questions, right? To see if some of our intuitions are right, they may be wrong, and you can kind of test that empirically. I know Jackie Schneider, uh, Reed Polly, and Eric Lynn Greenberg have a great working paper on uh, wargaming for research methods in political science. Um, that's a really fantastic framework for how we're thinking through about kind of different ways of using wargamings for things like cyber, AI, drones. Um, et cetera. Um, Ellie Bartels at the RAND Corporation has done some really great work on epistemology of wargaming, so helping us think through kind of broader notions of science and the art of wargaming as well. So there's some really exciting work going on there. And I think well-designed games can really be effective tools for understanding and judgment, understanding psychology, group dynamics, and the role that uncertainty and emotion kind of always plays in decision making. And I think the process of play can influence our behavior and that can help us to build good habits, right? So I think you can, um, when you encounter new or unknown situations that are kind of outside of our normal ad analytical frameworks, uh, we don't necessarily know how to respond. And Jackie Schneider's work in a different paper talks about how we really try to seek cognitive closure very quickly, and that can really lead us astray. And it can be dangerous if you're a decision maker on issues of national security, war and peace. So I think there's a real benefit to wargaming, even just for the sake of wargaming, to build better habits, to improve one's judgments in the face of uncertainty, and to cultivate this kind of emotional intelligence that I found in the early 1950s war game, to better model human behavior. I think it's especially relevant on the topic that uh, Jane's um, discussing today the, the prospect of AI especially. You know, it's not just what the AI can do, it's what we believe it can do, right, as decision makers. And we create a lot of myths around AI. So I think wargaming can be especially useful for thinking about this human machine interaction and thinking about the psychology of those dynamics and how it frames our decision making. Thanks, John. I'm going to take a quick pause now in the questions just to remind everyone watching that we're going to have time at the end. So if you'd like to submit your questions for the panelists now, now is the time to do it. The CSIS uh, Future Strategy Forum website has a Google form and you can just pop your question right in there. Um, and also the futurestrategyforum.com website is also a place where you can add your questions. Um, but moving back uh, to our questions here uh, and to an entirely different topic. Um, so this is a bit of a roller coaster panel. So each of your projects addresses and very different ways, the intersections between ethics, norms, values, and emotions on the one hand, and good research, good strategy on the other, or perhaps they're complementary and intertwined necessarily. So could you each speak to this intersection a little bit more, how this informs your work? So we'll start with Sahar, and then we'll go to John and then Jane. 
So, uh, yeah, the question of ethics is actually really interesting in, in my paper. I don't explicitly address it, but it actually underlies quite a lot of the concepts in there. I think you could probably write a whole separate paper on the issue of ethics uh, and talking about uh, security and privacy uh, kind of issues in this context. So there's a couple of threads I want to pull out. Uh, so one is what the government is asking for in this in this particular case, uh, Apple versus FBI, is a version of the operating system for the phone um, that has a vulnerability vulnerability in it or a backdoor. Now, these legitimate software updates that are you know pushed to computers and to phones underpin the whole software ecosystem. So they're verified by security protocols like unique cryptographic keys, which are basically saying the developer it has assured the user that uh, the software is uh, trustworthy, the code is trustworthy, and it functions um, as it's supposed to. So if the government is asking for a systematic compromise uh, of those updates, then users uh, can't be assured that the uh, about the security of their devices, um, which means they're not going to patch them, they're not going to keep them up to date, um, and that it's going to leave them and their devices vulnerable to uh, other threats, basically. So you can look at a really significant, uh, a couple really significant examples in the last couple of years that demonstrate this uh, to see the impact of what um, having control over uh, something like a software update. Uh, can can really mean. So one that some may have heard of is um, uh, NotPetya, uh, the wiper that um, uh, hit several organizations back in 2017 um, and basically wiped their data. And uh, that particular um, destructive attack was regarded as one of the most financially damaging um, that we've ever seen. And that was done through uh, the compromised software update um, of an accounting software that was popular in, in Ukraine. So having control over uh, such a fundamental part of the, the uh, kind of software ecosystem and that uh, infrastructure is, is really powerful. Um, another example is more recent, which you also might have heard of, is the SolarWinds uh, campaign. Um, and in that, um, uh, the Russians... Uh, basically did the same thing and compromised this uh, software update of an IT management uh, product that SolarWinds makes called Orion. Um, and in the same way, they, they uh, were able to uh, kind of conduct these intrusions into um, you know, government agencies, other high profile organizations, and that basically became uh, quite a, a massive um, event and incident in the news. Um, and and comes back to the question of the you know, kind of security and, and trust in, in that particular software and the infrastructure. Um, and, and in those cases, you know, these were rogue states. In both cases, it was Russia. But the principle is is kind of still the same. So you're introducing a vulnerability um, into uh, into the software, which automatically means that it's opening it to opening it up to threats um, and uh, people who would uh, abuse it or use it maliciously in some way. So now imagine what would happen if you put uh, a government sanctioned backdoor uh, in 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 the software. Um, as opposed to uh, a malicious actor creating it and then using it for, for malicious purposes. Not only would they have introduced this permanent um, you know, method of access into user devices, but also it opens up the opportunity for other actors to piggyback off of that uh, same access already. Again, the, the kind of technical principles that underlie this, um, this particular topic are, are sound and they are um, pretty much unflinching. Um, the more complexity you introduce into a system, the more vulnerability there is and the more chance there is for or opportunity there is for exploitation. So basically exceptional access uh, or, or creating backdoors is really uh, um, kind of uh, kind of pushes the the um, the discussion in the in the ethics debate because uh, you're really talking about significant uh, kind of security and privacy implications. Um, and I think there's uh, kind of another example that would introduce um, uh, kind of the privacy uh, impact as well uh, in a different way, which is um, a couple of years ago, um, uh, Apple was looking to move um, uh, its um, to change the terms of its um, iCloud service and move the data uh, into servers that were hosted in China by a Chinese uh, company, and uh, basically. This is creating the um, you know the situation that the Chinese government could access the data if they wanted, uh, because maybe potentially parts of iCloud weren't encrypted, which means um, or even if they were, uh, China could serve uh, kind of Apple with a with a warrant and say we want access to this data. So um, you know we know that you know legality and ethics are not uh, equivalent, and uh, there's kind of different frameworks that you're going to need to approach this. But if we as the West would kind of 
um, you know, object to that kind of uh, infringement on, um, you know, a, a right to privacy and uh, oppose a, another government from accessing user data, then, you know, why wouldn't we object to it uh, here in the U.S. as well? So, um, yeah, I think the, the question of ethics kind of is always bubbling under the surface uh, of this topic um, because it gets quite um, uh, sensitive and, and um, affects issues of, of security and privacy. Yeah, thanks so much, Sahar. I'm like nervously gazing down at my iPhone now, <laughs> wondering what's going on. So really interested to read your paper. I think I think ethics is obviously quite central, um, quite central in my work. And I think we have this tendency, and I think it's a wrong tendency, to view emotion as having a negative impact on decision making, right? We want to try and be these kind of idealized, rational actors. And what I demonstrate in this paper is that through this kind of immersive war game with a high level of realism, that emotion actually has a positive impact on decision making. You have real nuclear restraint. And that's what Corey Shockey was able to point out to me in kind of our workshop of this paper is that even though they didn't use moral language, you still had moral outcomes. So that's kind of an interesting puzzle for me. How do you get it if you're not talking about ethics explicitly? How does it lead you to kind of these moral outcomes? And I build on kind of Reed Polly's 2018 International Security article where he studied Lincoln Bloomfield's uh, MIT political military games from 1958 to 1964. And he found the same thing, that uh, decision makers were really hesitant to press the button. The reason uh, and the logics uh, that he found were that they kind of comport most strongly with logics of deterrence, practicality, and, and reputation. And there was no evidence of kind of explicit ethical arguments. And so what I argue is that um, this kind of originary war game that kind of morphed into this MIT war game that uh, Reed studied uh, was that ethics was de excluded as kind of a de facto non-rational discourse, right? You would be laughed out of the room if you were talking about ethics. And yet it bubbled up through the kind of lens of emotion. So in Polly's work, only two out of 26 games over that period went nuclear. But when they did, they felt really bad about it. So one participant reflected that it was really sobering for him and disturbing to realize that a handful of men in the United States and Soviet Union um, can decide the fate of hundreds of millions, including many not in either country, right? And Lincoln Bloomfield himself said that sometimes coming out of the war games uh, was like coming out of a deep sleep after a particularly vivid dream. It takes time for the carryover of the emotional content of the game to wear off. To wear off. And so you see all of these kind of throughout the weight of emotion, how it plays. So even though techno-strategic language excludes ethical arguments, there's something there about the process of physical play that engages our emotions, and I argue our ethical intuitions. And so Valerie Markavisich has a great article called Tin Men Ethics, um, talking about kind of AI and lethal autonomous weapon systems. And she argues that emotions can help us to act morally by informing our moral intuition, by generating empathy and holding us accountable for our choices. Our emotions as expressions of our inner soul or our conscience uh, actually guide us toward more ethical behavior. And so I think that that's a kind of good way of framing this that, you know, even though you may not get answers from war games that might be empirically valid in the world, there's still something valuable about playing them because it does engage you emotionally in a way that your writing may not. And I think that's an important process, especially for policymakers and decision makers on issues of war and peace. It's so a third myth busted across the projects that emotions complicate uh, decision making in a bad way. They can they could be a boon to, to policy making, decision making. Jane, over to you. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just briefly pick up on maybe not the ethics side of your question, but the norms and beliefs um, element of it. Something that I've encountered is um, sort of in the sort of arms control context, um, things that I would normally assume or initially assume to be the product of some deliberate calculation or, or analysis is actually the product of a normative belief or a practice or an assumption. So for example, like how sure do you have to be that another state is not cheating um, in an arms control deal? Um, maybe you'd think that sort of the level of how sure you need to be depends on sort of what the deal gets you or how bad cheating is. But in reality, um, it also has a lot to do with um, biases and beliefs and, of course, domestic debates in U.S. politics, which have a lot to do with biases and beliefs and much less to do with the sort of the deals themselves. So the sort of what does it mean to be sufficiently sure is a pretty arbitrary and subjective uh, judgment. And in thinking about kind of 
what happens when we start um, introducing emerging technology questions into that space. Um, I think it'll be very challenging to unpack um, the sort of the assumptions about risk and uncertainty. So some technologies, right, you might think that um, uh, satellite, advanced satellite surveillance, uh, they narrow uncertainty in, in pretty big ways. Um, but at the same time, the increasingly public accessibility of these capabilities may also make it more difficult for states to leverage that uncertainty to negotiate privately, for example. Um, AI seems to have sort of big analytic advantages, but it also, research has shown that AI fails in strange and unexpected ways, creating new uncertainties of its own. Now, how will that interact with a policy debate, sort of an arms control policy debate, which is often pretty locked into a seemingly um, binary view about whether or not a deal is verifiable or not, um, which is not really something you're going to get um, as an answer from incorporating an emerging technology. Thanks. So we're going to turn now to some questions from um, from our audience. And uh, I have to say, it's almost as if they're all coordinated with each other because they they follow each other really beautifully. So we'll see if we can if we can get to, to all of them. So first, Suzanne from MIT asks, what are the key policy recommendations from Saher's work to the tech world and government and to the nuclear policymakers from Jane's work? Um, and I'll, I'll put the question to John, too, if there are policy prescriptions that flow from your work. Uh, welcome to chime in on that as well. So let's start with Saher. So um, this is a really tricky one to recommend policies for because it's a it's kind of a highly politicized debate. And to be honest, if there was a solution already, um, you know, we wouldn't still be having the debate. Um, and so, you know, first and foremost, it seems kind of obvious, but um, I don't think it's the kind of necessarily prevalent view. Don't ban encryption. Uh, don't regulate encryption. Um, there have been a couple attempts, and I think it's something that uh, you know policymakers should understand that it's a technology uh, that has you know um, you know been around since the 70s or 80s. It's not going anywhere. It's now spread further than ever. A lot of companies are building uh, encryption into their services and their products. Uh, it's here to stay, and it's a good thing. It's it's to secure data and it's to uh, keep it private. So it does serve a lot of purposes, and I don't think. You know, uh, you know, the government would argue that it's a bad thing either, um, because it obviously helps them as well. Um, so I think one of the Im most important things is to really, in in this particular case, uh, as with I'm sure many other issues, is listen to the experts, the technical experts who are, um, you know, who have done, uh, you know so much research on the topic and demonstrated again and again, um, you know, that in cryptography and in encryption, um, you know, these are absolutes that we're talking about. Security has to be absolute. If you're weakening it in any way, uh, it's weakening it for everybody and uh, it compromises the whole system. So I think uh, regulating encryption is uh, a bad idea. Um, uh, other than that, uh, I do think that there should be uh, kind of more participation from academia, from the industry. Um, there, I think there is a really big gap between kind of technology and uh, the policy world. Um, and there's probably very few people who actually are able to, you know, uh, speak to both and are kind of fluent in that in, in both of those languages. And I think there is there's quite a gap. So I think that gap really needs to be bridged um, because, again, they're two very separate areas, but, um, you know, they're they're heavily intertwined over a lot of different subject areas. Um, so kind of uh, enforcing that public private partnership and making sure that, um, you know, the expertise is, is kind of first and foremost um, being communicated uh, to policymakers is, is really important. Should I go next? Sure. Um, so there's, yeah, so there's a number of policy implications and I'll just um, quickly highlight two. First, I think um, we should be uh, thinking a lot about the possibilities for agreements uh, with no intrusive monitoring. Essentially agreements that don't rely on the inspections regimes that many have come to accept as sort of best practices. Um, I think there can be important advantages in refocusing that verifiability conversation on uh, maybe like international technical means, um, sort of what states can achieve using non-intrusive and primarily publicly available data sources. Um, second, um, the use of emerging technology in intrusive verification, it does have exciting promise. 
but addressing that transparency security trade-off um, is critical to sort of be able to move forward with any of this. And sort of states have to be able to demonstrate information to one another. One path forward here could be the joint development or co-development of technology applications alongside experts in other countries. So there might be no way to convince another country that you know our AI tool is doing what we say it's doing and no way that I'm going to believe that from somebody else. But if we build a whole um, new AI application together from the ground up, the understanding of its capacity and limits might be greater. And sort of this, uh, this point on technical cooperation is not a new idea. The US and the Soviet Union did this during the Cold War, even during moments of really poor relations. But I think um, it now has a uh, renewed imperative um, in light of the opportunities and uncertainties provided by some of these emerging technologies. Yeah, and I'll just offer kind of two policy prescriptions and one that really came out in kind of Jane's paper is taking uncertainty seriously and recognizing that you can never fully eliminate it, right? I think there's a real danger today um, that we seek certainty in kind of the rigorous outputs of AI and quantitative analyses that they offer us some form of kind of objective number by which to make decisions. But we have to remain cognizant of the fact that human judgment always goes into the operationalization of the kind of programming that leads to these outputs. And the fundamental assumptions we make in our modeling of the social world throughout history have often been proven wrong. And so to look at a point that Sana made on the panel earlier today is that you know, artificial intelligence is always imbued with uh, assumptions about programming, about the values, about our society. And so numbers can tend to be subductive for their supposed objectivity, but they can also just as easily lead us astray if they're not accurate representations of the social world. So never neglect the kind of chaos and uncertainty of human agency, especially when it comes to war in these novel technologies. And I think the second point that Zahair kind of highlights is uh, the necessity of interdisciplinarity, right? We need to be having communications with technical experts. So those of us in academia or in the policy world have a good understanding of the capabilities of these technologies that we're using and not just a myth or an idea that artificial intelligence is somehow better than human judgment. And simultaneously with that, you can get a group together to really understand kind of psychology, the dynamics, the experience, um, and not necessarily to eliminate emotion in the kind of decision making process, but to cultivate it through the practice, through a kind of kind of ethical, practical judgment um, in security affairs. Uh, thanks. So we have two questions that I'm going to pair together. So I want to preface the questions by saying that the Future Strategy Forum, one of, one of its missions, one of its goals is to take academic thinking and to bridge the divide to policy and to sort of make the case almost that that isn't necessarily such a such a big divide and that academia does inform uh, policy in myriad ways. And so these two questions kind of speak to that in, in, in different ways. So I'm going to ask them together for you to, in, in our remaining few minutes, you can kind of each take a stab at them to the extent you'd like to. So Emma from MIT asks, as part of FSF, we have a co cohort of current graduate students who are all dedicated and interested in these topics. Where do you think are areas that would benefit from further research? And then Diana from the University of Chicago Naval Postgraduate School asks, have you found there to be a tension between the policy relevance of your work and political science disciplinary norms or the demands academia places on early career researchers? And how have you managed it? So. Uh, we can let's see let's why don't we reverse the order uh, that we started in we can go john jane sahar yeah absolutely fantastic questions and i think there's pretty much we're at a time where there's unlimited research in the academic field that needs to be done and a lot of it is policy relevant so i think if you're part of the future strategy forum you're already trying to tackle these issues and i think one way that we can do it is try and tackle it in novel ways right we often get we often get uh, stuck in kind of our academic debates and we miss the kind of big picture. And that's why, you know, looking back to kind of historical analogies or things like that can be useful because it gives you something concrete rather than just kind of abstract theorizing. So I think that's helpful. And I think there is a tension between, you know, the kind of difficulties of being an early career scholar in academia and the tension of policy relevance. So I think get involved as much as you can in CSIS, other think tanks and, uh, 
and do what you can to get involved and have that impact on policy. So through this research, I was able to join in some military and civilian war gaming at the Rand Corporation. And it was really insightful for me to understand how military decision makers think very differently uh, than I would, but how we can really inform each other. So get involved as much as you can. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's an excellent point. And I, I think that while there are tensions between policy relevant um, work and research and some of the norms within political science, maybe this is a controversial thing to say, but I kind of think that the degree of that tension or that dispute is maybe itself a mis myth that should be busted. Um, I don't know. I think a lot of great emerging work in security studies is both rigorous political science and policy relevant. And I would just say, I don't know, more doing and less arguing about it. Uh, lastly, quickly, I would uh, definitely echo what, what Jane and John said. Um, uh, and if you're interested in things like emerging technologies and security, um, you know, get into cybersecurity. I, I have to tell you, it wasn't my initial uh, kind of path in my career that I was planning on, but you'd be shocked at how, you know, little kind of social sciences and humanities are represented in this field and how, ne you know, necessary and, and quite crucial they are, uh, because that perspective is just, uh, you know, kind of not there. The critical thinking skills, the analysis skills, um, you, uh, it, that the field could really benefit from kind of broadening uh, the scope there in terms of people who are, who are entering the field. So um, yeah, your skills and, and kind of knowledge definitely apply. That's something I would definitely recommend uh, thinking about. I'll also just chime in and echo uh, Jane's point. I, I kind of also take the the view that this is almost um, this tension, this um, this divide between academia and policy. Although it is there, the size might be a bit uh, overestimated these days, uh, in part because of really good work that's been done by CSIS, by the Kissinger Center, um, War on the Rocks, TNSR, even Twitter. You know, for for better and for worse. I think there are just there's so many opportunities for scholars to find ways to communicate their research uh, to. A, a policy audience. Um, and also when academics go into policy directly, that's another way for academia or at least, you know, the training to inform the way that the work is done. So yeah, I, I'm, I've been um, kind of excited to, to see how many opportunities there are to bridge that divide. So okay, with that, we have about a few minutes left. I'm going to just turn the floor over to Jane, who I think wanted to lead us in, in a toast. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rachel, for moderating this um, excellent panel. Um, so I just wanted to sort of close our discussion. Um, and as a final note, I would like to raise a toast to and ask my co-panelists to join me in raising a toast uh, to Jan Nolan. She supported uh, emerging scholars, and I think uh, she really encouraged confidence in working on unpopular opinions or untrendy topics um, because as she said you are probably right and everyone else is just missing something important uh, she probably would have uh, found video conferences to be horribly tiresome and would have enjoyed everyone uh, mingling and meeting uh, after a panel like this one um, so here's also to doing that next time cheers Thank you so much, Jane, and thanks to each of our panelists for a conversation that took us from nuclear war games at RAND in the 1950s to exceptional access for targeted surveillance to how emerging technologies may shape the future of arms control. Talked about intellectual myths. I think we, we hit on four myths by the end of this conversation, research methodology and ethics. Uh, I learned so much from our conversation today, and I can't wait to see your papers in print. Um, so that is a wrap for our panel, but it is not a wrap for Future Strategy Forum 2021. Um, please stick around for our closing keynote address, Emerging Technologies and Nuclear Weapons, with none other than Rose Gottmuller. So I'm going to pass the microphone over now to Ms. Beverly Kirk, the host of our keynote conversation and the director of the Smart Women, Smart Power Initiative at CSIS. So I hope you can all stick around and, and remain with us for our keynote. Okay, bye everyone. Rachel, thank you so very much. And uh, cheers uh, to the late Jan Nolan, who was fabulous and participated in the very first Future Strategy Forum back in 
2018. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am Beverly Kirk, Director of the Smart Women, Smart Power Initiative here at CSIS and a fellow and Director for Outreach in the International Security Program. And thanks for joining us for our uh, closing keynote conversation on emerging technologies and nuclear weapons. I am very honored to welcome Rose Gott Muller, the former Deputy Secretary General of NATO as our closing keynote speaker. She is currently the Payne Distinguished Lecturer at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University and a research fellow at the Hoover Institution. And again, our conversation is focused on emerging technologies and nuclear weapons. And for those of you in our virtual audience, please feel free to submit questions on the CSIS uh, event page for this event. Uh, please go there. There's a big button that says ask a question and we welcome your questions. And Rose, thank you so much for being here uh, with us for this event. It is an honor to chat with you. And uh, we were talking in the green room before we started. I think this is our third conversation. It is, and it's a pleasure to be here with you, Beverly. And what a wonderful conversation we dipped into at the end. So I know you're having a fantastic event over the last two days. Yes, it has been it has been lots of fun and incredibly informative. I know I've learned a lot, and I know our audience is going to learn a lot from this conversation because the first question I want to ask you is about what are the challenges and the opportunities that exist in terms of emerging technologies and disruptive technologies in terms of the nuclear space and nuclear weapons specifically. Beverly, I'll come to that in just a minute and very happy that we're going to uh, tackle this topic today because it is so important. But before I do so, I just wanted to tell a tiny little vignette about Jan Nolan and congratulations to all the Jan Nolan award winners. It was uh, well, it was a great thing to establish that award, and I'm glad to see her her legacy is, is going forward in that way. But I would not have ended up uh, leaving the RAND Corporation and going into the Clinton administration if it hadn't been for Jan Nolan. She came to me at the time. It was the transition from Bush to Clinton. And she said, look, I've got a new baby at home, her dear Emily, her little Emily. She said, I, I can't really go into the administration. Would you be interested? And so I was introduced afterwards to the leaders of the Clinton transition and managed to land inside the administration and worked there for five of the eight years. And it was a wonderful formative experience. But I just wanted to recollect that. And for all of you who have depended on mentors over the years, just to let you know, as Jan Nolan was a mentor to many of you, she was a mentor to me. To, and I was glad to help her out when her dear Emily was a baby. <laughs> <laughs> that but, is a wonderful story. And uh, really, she and I were dear friends uh, for her uh, life, and, and I was sorry to say farewell to her, but God bless her. Anyway, on to your very important question. And to answer that question, I want to refer to, uh, I think it's a really interesting and, and in some ways amusing study. Many of you will know it. It's uh, Emerging and Disruptive Technologies, Multi-Domain Complexity and Strategic Stability, a review assess and assessment of the literature. Brad Roberts and his team at the Center for Global Security Research at Lawrence Livermore did it, and it was published in February. It is, well, I will say it's amusing because it's clear that there are no fixed views of where emerging and disruptive technologies are taking us. And I think that's been a theme you've been discussing over the last two days, but it's also very applicable to the nuclear realm. Uh, some of the uh, authors that, uh, that they reviewed, that the Livermore team reviewed, said it's going to lead to faster nuclear ex escalation. Other authors said it's going to lead to a slowdown in nuclear escalation. So I think that is really a thumbnail sketch of where these uh, technologies are taking us with regard to nuclear weapons. And it behooves us as policymakers, also as, as analysts, as, as those who are thinking through the implications of these technologies to, to really pay attention to, well, stopping or putting barriers in the way of the negative developments that may ensue, like faster escalation. And I know for that reason, so many are thinking about how to do uh, better now on uh, confidence building, mutual transparency and predictability, looking for measures to hamper crisis developing into conflict and, and heaven forbid to nuclear escalation. So I think it does place added responsibility on the shoulders of, of our community 
But nevertheless, I do want to really stress as we begin that there are two sides of this picture. One is a negative picture, but the other might be quite a positive picture. And we'll delve into that uh, a little bit deeper in just a moment. I also want to specifically ask you about, about threats associated with um, emerging and disruptive technologies and how the U.S. should prepare to deal with them. Are we prepared? Are we preparing? We're definitely preparing, and the answer to your question uh, revolves around redundancy and resilience. I think we absolutely, well, we have to be very good, uh, and I really want to applaud the speaker in the previous panel who talked about uh, the importance of careers in cybersecurity. We need all the talent we can get in that realm, but cybersecurity uh, must be at the forefront, and the U.S. must be on the leading edge of providing for security for our cyber networks overall. That's just one example, but in general, we need to be on the leading edge of technology development, whether it's artificial technology, whether it's quantum technologies, we need to be on the leading edge so that we are in a commanding position to understand where the trend lines are going, to also understand what we need to do to deter and defend, but also what we may uh, need to do in terms of, of providing for the continuity of our own, of our own state. And um, in that uh, arena, we cannot you know, we, we really cannot let the race get beyond us. We need to be involved and, and engaged in uh, the leading edge of technological development. But uh, in terms of the tools that we have available to us, some are very simple tools that we've been using all along, and we use them very much in the era of Soviet war fighting, when we expected the Soviet Union to use nuclear weapons from one end of the escalation ladder to the other as a tool of war fighting. And in that really dire environment, we had to focus on resilience and redundancy. And I think it's the same thing today. And I place particular emphasis on the resilience and redundancy of uh, our networks uh, and uh, in those networks, our command and control capabilities, so many of which today are dependent uh, both on computer networks, but also on space-based assets. So we really do have to emphasize those simple tools of resilience and redundancy. Uh -huh. And what about threats from, from adversaries that we should be concerned about in terms of their development of emerging technologies? Well, that's why it's so important to stay on the leading edge so we know what the other guy's doing and so that we have early warning if uh, developments are heading in a particular uh, direction with regard to weaponization or with regard to military tactics and strategy. Uh, it's important for us to understand what the other guy is up to. Some of that is old fashioned, of course, uh, intelligence gathering and uh, states will continue to do that. But I think really having that understanding uh, of where uh, science is leading, what kinds of technological developments are out there, what the, the scope uh, is of their development is, is super important. Uh, because otherwise we will not fully understand what kinds of threats may be coming at us. It, you said just a moment ago that there seem to be two camps uh, in the emerging technology field, those who um, are concerned about the, the potentially negative uh, implications of emerging technology in the nuclear sphere, and then those who see lots of positive opportunities. Uh, and you talked about this in a lecture last month, and while you were talking about this, you raised a number of questions in that lecture. So I'm, I'm going to ask you those questions and see, uh, see what your, your thoughts are. Um, one of the questions you, you said that needed to be considered will such emerging technologies, and just for those who are listening, we're talking about AI, machine learning, um, quantum computing, all of that. Um, are these technologies going to underpin more risk taking or less? In other words, is it gonna make, uh, is it gonna make us more willing to take risks because we have the technology or perhaps less willing to take risks because we're concerned uh, about the implications? I think it's impossible to answer that question, Beverly, because it's so scenario dependent uh, that it, it really, I think, will, will depend quite a bit on what the overarching circumstances are, uh, what, again, what the adversary is up to, uh, what our capabilities are. I'm not trying to duck the question, but I do want to stress, you said, you know, I seem to indicate that people 
fall into two camps. Again, I don't think people are consistent in their views. Experts are consistent in their views. It's not, not like someone is over here on the, on the sunny side of the street saying it's this is all going to be great and there are no problems, and, and the other side of the street are the Cassandras. I think, I think people really look at these different technologies and try to balance opportunity and risk, challenge and risk in looking at them and in particular circumstances. I was uh, quoting uh, the Livermore study because in that particular circumstance, people were looking at uh, nuclear escalation mm -hmm. and what might be the challenges and opportunities there. And as I said, some saw the brakes being put on, some saw an opportunity for acceleration and even uncontrolled acceleration, uncontrolled escalation. So, but I don't think they're actually two camps. I think it is very dependent on uh, the scenario, on the technology, on the challenges, on the threat environment. How do you foresee emerging technologies uh, uh, helping decision makers? Will, the, will it be, will it make them be able to make more precise or more well uh, analyzed decisions or will the, basically the new technologies add to the information overload that a lot of people feel technology brings already? Well, of course, we have to be very mindful of the potential of information overload, but I, I am just going to use a very simple example to juxtapose the Cold War with today, and that is the Cuban Missile Crisis, which many experts uh, on this call will be familiar with and have analyzed at depth, but we all realize how very little information Kennedy and Khrushchev had to go on and they were making use of uh, proxies, they were making use of, of some behind the scenes communication, but they were really judging the situation uh, on the basis of, of very little uh, understanding of the dynamics inside the Kremlin, inside the White House, but also, uh, as we found out later, on faulty uh, intelligence information. Today, we have the opportunity with this enormous amount of information, as well as, uh, again, the resiliency and redundancy of communication links to really, I think, be able to handle and to manage a crisis a lot better. So I do tend to be among those who see opportunity in the, uh, in the very uh, large amount of information available, as well as the communication tools available to leaders to really head off disaster in future. But a lot depends on, again, having the analytic tools to really make that usable information. And the analytic tools in, in, present in big data analysis, they are there, they are present. So we just have to figure out how to prioritize and how to really get the leaders the information they need. Uh, that is going to be all important in, in the upcoming period. Uh, but in general, I feel like uh, we, we should be able to manage and handle information overload as long as we are uh, doing the analysis right and understanding, again, it comes down to what does a, a, what does a decision maker need to make the right decision and not just, you know, throwing a lot of stuff at him or her and certainly not in the middle of a crisis. It, will autonomous systems threaten the role of humans in managing and steering conflict? Or are we way not far away we, from that? Not if we don't let them. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's always a huge debate about, uh, well, we used to say a man in the loop, uh, keeping uh, humans in the loop. Uh, I do think that that's important. Again, I understand the challenges that are out there as uh, autonomous systems drive action uh, faster and faster. Uh, there's no question that it becomes more difficult to keep a human in, in the loop. But I think that we, we have agency in this. Uh, as, as humans, we have agency in this, and we need to be mindful at every step of the way and not allow ourselves to become entrapped by the notion of uh, automaticity uh, driving and particularly driving crisis and conflict that could lead to a nuclear exchange. That is just, that's a recipe for the destruction of, of the human race. So we cannot allow that to happen, but we have agency here. And so we need to be mindful and, and, uh, and keep, our, uh, keep our eye on what we need to accomplish in terms of constraining and, and controlling these technologies. So no worries about robots taking away decision-making power. Again, not if we don't let them. <laughs> not if we don't let them. Um, there are some who are concerned that the technologies may somehow make the use of nuclear weapons more possible. What are your thoughts on that? Does it make it more or, or, or could it in fact make it less? 
There's been a certain amount of debate and discussion about uh, the potential now for resuming uh, approaches that would allow for retaliation no matter what happens. And I'm talking about the so-called dead hand technologies uh, that uh, the Soviets developed such a system evidently. Uh, so that is a worry, and I think we need to be aware, and this is why it is so important that this be uh, an international discussion and a discussion that involves uh, the community of leaders uh, in, engaged uh, from the kind of normative side of things down to talking about specifically perhaps some regulatory measures over time, that we do not want to see this kind of technology become widespread and certainly, as I said, in a way that would uh, permit uh, a nuclear uh, a nuclear exchange to escalate out of the control of all of all human uh, all human agency. So this this is I think where we need to really draw the line, and it's a dead serious matter. I have actually been glad to see the degree to which uh, already some uh, leaders of of the nuclear weapon states are beginning to talk about the necessity of nuclear command and control. Uh, being uh, in a kind of uh, protected zone where we are not trying to mess with the NCA, with the uh, National Command Authority, the Nuclear Command and Control of other states uh, as it might be hosted, for example, on space-based assets. So already there is some discussion of this, some awareness developing, and it's not, well, it, it may be at the moment a bit of the technological Wild West, but it, it is a moment at which I think people are beginning to think that we, in fact, need to have uh, some agreement uh, among ourselves that nuclear command and control needs to be in a protected state and that we should not be undermining each other's capabilities in this regard. Let me follow up just a bit. You mentioned the, the need for international uh, uh, conversation in this area. Are those kinds of talks happening at the, at the level and rate that they, that they should be as these emerging technologies continue to de develop and develop rapidly? There is an international conversation that has been going on for a long time. I do believe it is, it is too routinized. Uh, obviously, in Geneva, there are uh, venues in which the uh, uh, systems of uh, automatic uh, automatic weapons, uh, not automatic weapons like guns, but I'm talking about autonomous weapons, sorry, uh, have been taking place for some period of time. But I do feel like this is a, a moment at which we need to we need to uh, kick this conversation up and make it less routinized. And for that reason, as I said, I've begun to welcome. Uh, some of the higher level attention to this matter and the notion that perhaps this should be a topic for strategic stability talks, for example, between the United States and Russia or among the P5 states, US, China, UK, France, uh, and Russia, so that we have a discussion going on at a higher level and with more attention to it. I take my hat off to those who have been involved for many years in the Geneva venues, in the Geneva talks. It's been very important and has laid some important groundwork. It's laid out some important definitions. Uh, all of this very important work, but I do think it's time that, that we kick it to a higher level. We have a, a question from the audience, and, and thank you very much, uh, Hiroki, for this question. Uh, should the impacts and implications of China's rapid nuclear and conventional armament development and rise in asymmetric military capability be discussed as part of the U.S.-Russia dialogue? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think that uh, there's already, as uh, viewers will be aware, a conversation among the P5 on strategic stability issues. I do think my personal view as a diplomat is bilateral matters should be kept <laughs> in a bilateral uh, in a bilateral forum, and so the United States uh, can and should talk with China. It can and should talk with Russia. At some point, we may decide that we want to get together and have a trilateral discussion. And I do hope that we will continue to have uh, P5 discussions of, of stability matters. To be honest with you, I don't believe that uh, Russia would be willing to have a, a really intensive conversation on these matters without China in the room. Uh, but uh, it's it's a matter of diplomatic practice also to say, does it make sense for Russia and the United States to be talking about China without China in the room on these particular kinds uh, of issues that are so important to strategic stability overall? 
And uh, Hiroki asks another question um, uh, along these lines. What aspects of arms control, emerging technologies, and security domains in combat should be addressed in the U.S.-Russia Strategic Stability Dialogue? They are going to begin with nuclear, and we saw that in the early exchanges, the telephone conversation between President Biden and President Putin. They have been talking about addressing uh, really that uh, overhang of the nuclear weapon of mass destruction and what needs to be done both to develop a follow-on agreement after the new START treaty, but also then to expand uh, the agenda of strategic stability talks to discuss any any number of topics, including some of these new technologies, such as the expansion of space-based uh, assets, space-based capabilities. So I think that um, this will be, you know, obviously a priority for the two presidents. Uh, it is a different question whether we should be getting into talking in that venue about uh, cyber technology, for example, and many experts argue that, yes, indeed, it is relevant to the traditional uh, venue of strategic stability, and indeed, we need to bring it in because of that impact I was talking about a moment ago, that very capable cyber, cap very safe, capable cyber means can be used to, uh, to undermine your uh, nuclear uh, command and control. So, yes, perhaps it is relevant. I have to say I'm not quite there yet myself, and I do think that here is an area where we've had very, very good discussions on cyber technology, cyber uh, cyber um, confidence building measures over the years with the Russians. Uh, we've done it not only on a bilateral basis, the U.S. and Russia, but also in the U.N. setting, a U.N. group of government experts, as well as uh, a separate venue in the U.N., and also the OSCE in, Gen in, sorry, in Vienna. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe has had a very good discussion going on over the years and has accomplished some gains on cyber uh, cyber confidence building. So, frankly, to be honest with you, I'm not quite sure in this arena. I'd be glad to hear from, from listeners today what they think about this matter. Is the, the whole development of the cyber arena and the cyber threats affecting uh, nuclear weapon systems, is this something that, that really brings this topic into traditional strategic stability talks, or do we continue to handle it in a different venue? And to be honest with you, I'm still on the fence about that. Well, if I could press you a little bit on the on the, the cyber threat uh, uh, issue, um, the threats are developing in the cyber sphere almost as fast as the technology, or perhaps even faster than the technology can be developed to deal with the the, the cyber threats. And how 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 can we keep up with the threats? and be prepared to deal with them, um, particularly if you have adversaries who use cyber activities in order to uh, create issues. And, you know, when do you get to a point that you decide how, do you, how should a country respond to a cyber attack? And this is not only in the nuclear sphere, but, you know, writ large. Um, I would love to get your thoughts on, on that because this is a threat that is ever present and is only increasing. Absolutely. And I will refer to my experience at NATO, where we created cyber as a domain of operations. You, Of course, you have to take it seriously. That means keeping uh, a very uh, keen eye on developments constantly, but also beginning to develop your, your tools so that you can be able to to address the threats, deal with the threats as they happen. Every big institution around the world, military, non-military, it doesn't matter, is under constant cyber attacks today. So it behooves any institution to, to be on top of this problem. That means uh, you know, the best possible cybersecurity means and methods, again, NATO paying very close attention to that, but then thinking through a domain of operations. If we are moving from war I'm sorry, from peace through crisis to war, what does that mean uh, for NATO? And that places the cyber domain on a spectrum from, uh, again, conventional means, uh, including cyber means, space-based assets. Uh, it really puts all the tools in your toolbox uh, on the table so that they are available for you in order to respond. Now, this is quite controversial. People wonder, would uh, 
a response be kinetic ever to a cyber attack? Well, I think the important uh, aspect of trying to build up deterrence in this area is to ensure that this spectrum of deterrence is is recognized and acknowledged as, as being there. And that's why I think it's important to think about cyber as a domain of operation. We do so in NATO, we do so in the United States uh, as well, and to develop all those tools so that you can hope to deter, and if you can't deter, that you can defend. And uh, so it's it's a complex problem. It's a very difficult problem, but it is an everyday problem now. You know, NATO uh, is constantly under uh, pressure from not only cyber attacks, but the full panoply of hybrid threats. And that includes misinformation campaigns. Of course, cyber plays a big role in those as well. But, uh, you know, this is the reality of the situation today. And so um, military institutions worldwide are, are dealing with them. And I uh, can only hope we'll get better as time goes on. You mentioned the, the spectrum of potential responses. I, I guess, and maybe I should know the answer to this question, but is there ever a cyber threat or attack that could be carried out that would indeed prompt a NATO country, this country, to respond in, 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 in a military way? Well, if you're talking about kinetic attacks, it, it, can that, yes, yeah, kinetic. I what I want to just stress that I don't I don't want to uh, to uh, think about hypotheticals and and in any way give any ideas here that uh, I'm unclear of because we're talking about a hypothetical situation. But but that is the importance again of including uh, among the domains of operations uh, cyber means and methods in the domain of operations uh, domains of operation along with conventional, along with space-based assets, along uh, with, uh, heaven forbid, nuclear assets as well. It's all part of uh, the spectrum of deterrence that that is available. And so it means that we have various tools with which we deal with these uh, these kinds of threats, these kinds of attacks. But I don't want to speculate about any particular scenario because uh, I don't know how NATO would respond, nor do I know how the United States would respond. Well, something that you did work on, or at least this was going on at NATO while you were there, was the Russian use of information warfare tools uh, against NATO allies. Um, what's the potential impact of information warfare in the nuclear space, and does it increase the risk of any type of accidental escalation? Well, I think, you know, information warfare is... Uh, Again, it's always with us. It has been, uh, well, uh, I think about the Trojan horse as being an aspect of information warfare. Uh, we always used to call that one of the original hybrid threats, but probably even farther back to the caveman days, these kinds of threats were available where you try to psych out your opponent. And uh, you do that by, uh, by trying to trick him uh, with misinformation at the end of the day. And so it's always with us and it's something that we have to try to understand. But I think that makes it so important that we continue to depend on multiple ph phenomenology when we make decisions about nuclear response, that we not take uh, a single piece of information, a single warning indicator, that there be multiple sources of warning, multiple indicators and then we make the decision to respond. In this case, you have to be absolutely as certain as you can that actually a nuclear attack is underway. And that is, I think, you know, the, the fact of this weapon of mass destruction that you cannot afford to make these kinds of mistakes. You cannot afford to act on misinformation. So multiple sources of warning, multiple phenomenology, these are all important to any decision making that would go toward, uh, toward heaven forbid, again, a nuclear use. And given that technology changes so quickly, what are the implications in the near term for policymakers who are working on nuclear strategy? <laughs> try to stay on top of the game. It takes me back to my earliest, earliest point. The United States of America cannot afford 
to leave the field of technological battle. We have to be on the leading edge and we have to continue to put money into research and development. We have to, it has to be uh, a continued area where the government places a priority, but of course also in our system, and I'm glad of this, it's a big corporate responsibility as well. So we have to continue to invest in science and technology and research, and we have to, we have to stay on the leading edge. Mm-hmm. And Aaron from the Nuclear Threat Initiative has a question. Um, how escalatory do you believe a cyber attack on a U.S. critical space-based asset like early warning capabilities would or could be? How might the U.S. and Russia engage to reduce this risk through strategic stability talks? Well, I think first and foremost, uh, it will be important to take up these kinds of topics in uh, new strategic stability talks because uh, it is a situation where there's an equality of capability in some sense developing with the United States, uh, Russia and China particularly having uh, very capable uh, and increasingly capable uh, platforms uh, in, in orbit and having the capability essentially to mess with each other's assets. I'll put it that way very nicely. So it is important, I think, to continue to, um, uh, well, not to continue, but to really to launch into some very um, intensive discussions on this matter. I would argue here, this is a topic not only for bilateral discussions with the Russian Federation, but also for engaging China, again, whether that's in a, in a trilateral setting with Russia, whether it's in a P5 setting, or whether it's a bilateral conversation between Beijing and, and uh, Washington. I, I think it's very important that we set out uh, what, uh, how we see the threat, how we see the dangers emanating from that threat, how we would be concerned about our nuclear command and control, and how we would think that our counterparts would also be concerned about the reliability of their nuclear command and control. And it's when you have that confluence of interest that you can get to some agreement that you'll leave these assets alone. And in fact, historically, there have been areas of of sanctuary where uh, assets, particularly space-based assets, have been left alone. And uh, so I think we should be uh, refreshing our understanding of of the importance of that and and working on that as a priority objective for, for the future. And what about um, policy and force structure in terms of fast-changing technology? What are the implications there? Well, it's a good question. We are embarking on a modernization of uh, our nuclear forces in the United States. The Chi- uh, sorry, the Chinese are mo- modernizing, although uh, they haven't built up uh, to the levels anywhere near those of the United States or the Russian Federation. Russia, of course, has also uh, just completed a modernization of their strategic nuclear arsenal. So I think there's a there's a mixture here. It's mm-hmm. interesting that we are modernizing very traditional weapon systems, building a new submarine, building submarine-launched ballistic missiles, building a new manned bomber. Also, apparently, that bomber will have the capability to fly without a pilot. So there's cases here where we have quite traditional technologies that are mixing with new capability to operate in autonomous ways. Uh, There is discussion, of course, of building a new intercontinental ballistic missile, although there's debate over that. But again, that's a 70-year-old technology. Uh, If it is built and deployed, it will essentially hark back to that earlier period. So we are facing a very much a mixed picture here, and I think this is a conversation you've had throughout the last two days, that it's not a question of falling off a cliff and all, you know, falling off a cliff into a realm of new and emerging technology. We are mixing new and old, and that is going to continue to be the case. But what the implications of that in future will be, uh, will be very important. The hallmark of the bomber force was always its recallability, that it could be launched in a crisis, even a message convey, conveyed to the counterpart that the bomber force has been launched in a crisis. But then, should de-escalatory actions be taking place, the bombers can be recalled. And that was always seen as a great advantage for a manned bomber force. Now, if it's an autonomous bomber force, I'm sure it can be recalled as well. That can be programmed into the system, so to say. But uh, I think we will just, uh, to return to my initial point, we will just have a combination of the old and the new. 
And uh, so I don't necessarily see uh, implications for some of the older systems and, and how they operate. Yes, they will be more, perhaps uh, they will be more precise uh, in their targeting, their propulsion systems will be more reliable, their uh, materials out of which they are constructed will be more reliable, but uh, in some ways I don't see major changes for some of the weapon systems going forward. I, I, we're getting lots of great questions from uh, the audience. I have a quick follow-up on the point that um, that you just made about the we're mixing old and new technology, but I'm thinking as we are modernizing and planning to modernize, it takes time to actually build the new, more modern um, uh, equipment. And while we're building, the technology continues to change. Where do you find that balance in terms of, okay, I'm going to decide to use this technology that's cutting edge, it's fresh right now, but by the time we build what we need, there's always the risk that the technology will be outdated. It's the scourge of the current acquisition process, and I'm sure many of uh, colleagues watching who who work in acquisitions uh, in uh, the Department of Defense or elsewhere will understand the problem acutely. Certainly, we saw it at NATO that weapon systems are many years in development, and you try to stay on top of, of the cycles. It, uh, I think cyber technology is a great example. You try to stay on top of the cycles of software development, but it is extraordinarily difficult to do so. There have been some, uh, I think, you know, interesting developments in recent years, so-called uh, the cyber, I'm sorry, uh, spiral acquisition uh, methodologies and procedures that, that try to incorporate new technologies as uh, they are emerging on the scene. But it is difficult to do so. And frankly, the biggest, I, I think the biggest uh, step forward I can imagine is is trying to look for ways to simplify and speed up acquisition processes so that you can and and being able to incorporate changes in a judicious way uh, so that uh, some of these problems that have come about over time in uh, the way we try to build and develop uh, our military forces would be would be uh, addressed. But I'm not uh, someone who's a great expert in this, these areas. I'd be happy to hear from uh, viewers who uh, may have some comments on this themselves. Well, I will go to our next question from the audience. Uh, let's see here. Leah from Stanford University is a PhD candidate is asking, um, nuclear arms control and nuclear deterrence are often used as a model to understand other types of emerging technologies. Which technologies, if any, do you think this has the potential to be a useful model for? Should we be building on what we've learned in the nuclear space or trying to develop new models from scratch? Hmm. Well, people often ask this question when they're talking about arms control and can we use the model of nuclear arms control for something like cyber arms control? Frankly, I, my view is the answer is no, because when we were uh, you know, developing nuclear arms control measures over the years, arms limitation and arms reduction, we were looking at large items of hardware, items that were easily accountable, they were easily eliminated and destroyed, and you could even watch from outer space as a large missile was being destroyed. So we are now getting to more difficult problems in the nuclear arms control space as we're trying to directly limit nuclear warheads, which are small items, often uh, held in containers if they're in storage, uh, very difficult to track and trace, very sensitive facilities where they are uh, stored. So there are some challenges even in the nuclear arms control world, I think we can get our arms around them and proceed and, and have some continuing success in that arena. But when you're looking at cyber uh, technology, you're looking more at software than at hardware. And it's uh, impossible for me to think about how you would use some of these older tools of hardware limitation and control in, uh, the, in the cyber arena. So I think it's uh, quite different, uh, you know, when you think about some of these new and emerging technologies. That said, if uh, some of these uh, new technologies are 
uh, associated with large items of hardware. I don't know why some of the some of the procedures we've developed and precedents over time of the nuclear arms control world couldn't be applied here. But I do think that um, I do think that in general we have to be cautious about trying to apply the lessons of of the nuclear arms control um, decades uh, to this new era. Um, the last thing I'll say is actually, you know, nuclear <laughs> nuclear technology, nuclear uh, missiles, and uh, various delivery platforms, and the nuclear warheads themselves. That's an old technology. It's 70 years old at this point. Yes, there have been steady improvements over the years, but this is not something that I consider on the leading edge. Uh, the leading edge is where you've been putting your attention the last couple uh, days on on the new uh, quantum technologies that are emerging, on uh, AI, on uh, autonomous systems, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, to me, nuclear weapons are kind of the technology of, uh, of the past. Mm -hmm. Still very potent. I'm not arguing with their potency. And as I keep repeating, they are indeed that most fearsome of, of weapons of mass destruction, but nevertheless, they are an older technology. Mm -hmm. Daniel from UC Irvine asks, the U.S. has a long history of using force short of war in response to attacks and imminent threats. For example, limited stakes have been part of administrations from Reagan onward in context of terrorism and WMDs. First part of the question, should we distinguish when talking about kinetic attacks between war and force short of war? And two, could we imagine missile strikes or drone strikes or special forces raids being a just response to a cyber attack which is short of war? So there's a lot, a lot there. <laughs> Uh, there, there is a lot there, and again, we're uh, in the realm of uh, speculating about various scenarios that it, it makes it, you know, hard for me uh, to dive to dive in. But I will return to the point I made before: is that you you want to try to make your your toolkit uh, for deterrence and defense as wide ranging as possible, and then uh, try to ensure that your uh, potential adversary is not in doubt about your willingness uh, and uh, your readiness to use that toolkit uh, if if need be. To me, that's the essence of, of deterrence overall. But when we look at the history of, uh, of recent years, uh, I think you also see some precedents there in terms of the way, uh, you know, I'm not in any way speaking approvingly of some of the methods that have been used, but you know, drone attacks have been used quite extensively to respond to terrorist threats of various kinds. You know, So there are past precedents out there. Again, I think it takes a very thoroughgoing study to say, an analysis to say which of those precedents has been uh, beneficial to our thinking about the future of conflict and which has been deleterious. And uh, again, I'm, uh, I'm not gonna dive into talking about hypothetical scenarios. It, while you won't dive into talking about hypotheticals, who are you hoping is actually thinking about these hypothetical situations and coming up with um, answers to give to the U.S. government or who do you think um, uh, in, the, in the NATO allies, who are you hoping is actually thinking about these things and coming up with viable viable answers to the, these types of questions. Well, we've done a lot in recent years to build up our, uh, I think, our capabilities to think through these issues. The cyber command that was created in the United States now a decade ago, again, creating cyber as a domain of operations in NATO, also creating space as a domain of operations in NATO, but the Space Command established during the Trump administration. So there's uh, institutional capability being built up, and one hopes institutional capacity as well. I do want to mention for this audience, and I'm again, I'm interested uh, if, you've, uh, if you've wrestled with it in the last two days, uh, the issues that arise nowadays in the USG and in, uh, well, in any government institution, including at NATO, about how to hire the best people who are wrestling with these issues to come into government at a time when they can be making a lot more money elsewhere. 
Uh, and I know that uh, Department of Defense, for example, has tried to come up with some innovative ways to attract people from Silicon Valley to come into the Pentagon, perhaps work for a couple of years and then return uh, out to Silicon Valley again. NATO was looking at ways to do that, to bring in talent, give them ex some experience working inside uh, an international institution, and then they can return uh, to uh, to their previous, uh, previous uh, places of employment. But I think, I just want to mention, I think uh, we've got the right institutional ideas. We've got the right kind of uh, notion that we need to build up this kind of capability and capacity in government. But I do have a question whether we're able to attract the expertise that we need inside government because uh, simply governments don't pay nearly as much as the private sector. It's a simple problem, but a very complicated one to solve. And that question came up in our first panel today. If our audience members uh, are who were with us uh, in the with the panel that Suzanne Spaulding moderated, uh, we had a fabulous question from uh, a person who asked, you know, why should I, a newly minted um, PhD person or newly minted master's degree person, um, come out of, you know, a pre prestigious university? Uh, and join the government when I can make $200,000 working in a private security company right off the bat. And uh, the discussion talked about acknowledging the reality that that question presents, but also talking about the potential to earn even more in the private sector if you do spend a few years in government learning about the issues in government and how issues are dealt with in the government, that that's valuable information you can then take with you to the private sector. Absolutely, that's the case. And I think that's an important point. But the other thing I think is is really helpful is that ways of work are changing. Uh, the pandemic itself has, has driven our, our uh, ways of work in a different direction. But already before the pandemic, it was clear to me that uh, younger people are not as I was thinking, well, I never thought this way, but many people of my generation thought, okay, you get in at the ground floor in government and you stay in government from GS7 until you get to the senior executive service. So you spend your whole 40 years uh, of your career inside uh, government. And of course, it's important to get your pension and that kind of thing. But that was the mindset of my generation. And I don't see that across uh, the younger people I deal with at Stanford, other students I work with, uh, certainly my own children. The idea is, well, yeah, you may spend a few years somewhere and then you go somewhere else to get new experience, yes, to earn new money, better money. Uh, but I do think that our ways of working are changing thus significantly, and that could help this problem linked up to the point you just made that once you get some experience in government, it will help you uh, to earn more. So that's an important point. I will say that if you have the opportunity to work in a, uh, a really uh, fast moving area of government policy, there is no adrenaline rush like it. So I, I recommend government service for that purpose as well. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And and a, another person on this earlier panel talked about the the spirit of the mission that is present in working with government that's Absolutely. likely not present in the private sector. Absolutely, and that's that adrenaline rush I'm I'm talking about. It it really can be very important to uh, to life satisfaction. Uh, Aaron from the Nuclear Threat Initiative has another question for us. Uh, what reforms should NATO adopt to better respond to 21st century realities, including cyber information and hybrid warfare? Yeah, that's a great question, Aaron. And I think uh, it revolves, the answer revolves around uh, decision-making practices. And I've actually been very glad in the so-called NATO 2030 process that Secretary General Stoltenberg has had going on that a great deal of thinking has been uh, put into NATO decision-making practices. Of course, the strength of the alliance is in its consensus decision-making and the necessity of consensus being reached among the 30 allies for any important decision. But the notion that uh, groups of allies, perhaps at various junctures, in face of a crisis or conflict, uh, may be willing to act as a coalition of the willing inside NATO with the full support of the entire alliance. 
I think that this is an important innovation that was uh, recommended to the Secretary General, and I do understand is is undergoing some considerable analysis and thinking. We'll see what, what finally is recommended to the North Atlantic uh, Council, to the NATO uh, decision makers as a whole. But I think that area of, of more flexibility in decision making, giving NATO allies more options to work together in certain circumstances when other allies may not want to join, I think that's all very good and does not, in the end of the day, do anything to undermine the principle of consensus decision-making. So I really hope that uh, there will continue to be effort in that area and that that will be the big innovation coming out of the NATO 2030 process. You know, we started this conversation with me asking you about challenges and threats uh, presented by uh, emerging technologies, specifically as they relate uh, to the nuclear sphere. And I, I'm just curious if there is any one particular issue that you worry about that you, that actually keeps you up at night, that you don't hear policymakers talking about, that you wish they would spend some more time talking about how to prepare. Is there anything like that um, uh, that, that keeps you awake at night? Yes, I used to lose sleep over um, what we used to call the threat of nuclear terrorism. I still think, frankly, that is a worthy threat. I'm glad there, there are experts from the Nuclear Threat Initiative watching today because I think the work they do is really important to continue to draw attention to uh, this threat. Frankly, what keeps me awake at night is the fact that nuclear issues tend to be pushed onto the back burner and that there is not that much attention to them, except among uh, a group of, of experts and, and government policymakers. I know many watching today are very engaged and, and, uh, and intensely working uh, on these sets of problems, but it's, it's not uh, widespread. And getting the attention of the public and the willingness of the public to weigh in and to say this is a priority and it needs to be a priority for national policy. That's what concerns me because it is, it, it is um, when these things fall off the radar scope, when nuclear terrorism is suddenly seen as, you know, oh, that was the 1990s problem and we don't have to deal with it anymore. Or when uh, people think about uh, nuclear weapons only in the context of, of some movie they may have seen a few years ago, but they never think about the possibility that there could be nuclear escalation out of crisis and uh, a conventional conflict. These are the problems that I think really are, are very difficult for, for policymakers to confront. And uh, it's very frustrating as somebody who's worked in this area to realize the amount of heavy lifting that it takes to get people charged up with these issues and, and ready to, to really say to Washington or to say to Moscow or say to Beijing or wherever, you need to pay attention to getting these weapon systems under control because they are something that could really result in nuclear catastrophe, as Sam Nunn likes to say. Why have we let nuclear issues kind of be on the back burner? I, I, I will show my age by admitting this, but when I was growing up, the threat of nuclear annihilation was something that was ever present. Well, in some ways, it's a success story for policy, right? The nuclear weapon has not been used in uh, conflict since World War II. We have not had a, a serious uh, nuclear crisis since the Cuban Missile Crisis. There have been a number of, uh, of threats that have been out there. And again, I count uh, the threat of, of nuclear terrorism or fissile material theft and misuse. Uh, these were threats that we confronted with the breakup of the Soviet Union, by the way, very successfully working with Russia during that era, as well as the other states of the former Soviet Union. So um, there, there have been episodes where the public attention has been caught, but then other issues come to the fore. Right now it's climate change, and you know, out here in California, we're burning up already in May in a severe drought. And th these are, you know, these are the issues that are next door to every man, woman, and child in, in California, and they're concerned about them, but they're not concerned that a nuclear weapon is going to drop on their head tomorrow. I think they should be, uh, because uh, these are uh, imminent threats. They are kept at a very high level of readiness, as we know. 
but uh, in fact, uh, the stable relationship in this arena between the United States and Russia has also been sustained, and that's a good thing. I'm not arguing with the stability of our nuclear relationship, but uh, how we get more public attention to these areas, this is something that I have really been grappling with a lot. I won't say it keeps me up every night, Beverly, because not much keeps me up every night, but, uh, but it is something that I worry about pretty persistently. Yeah, uh, and I think it's a, uh, I, I think it's a worry that I think I that I probably share with you. Um, question uh, from Leah: She wants to know, uh, as we've talked about uh, nuclear versus emerging technology, but how can advances in technology aid in verification issues or other challenges in nuclear arms control? Is there anything that is making you optimistic? <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, and Leah must know of some of my work uh, here at Stanford. I've just taught a uh, class uh, during winter quarter where we looked at the potential for new technologies that can contribute to verification and monitoring down to the level of nuclear warheads, yes, but also helping us with some of the, the other problems that we have out there, such as how do we address North Korea's nuclear weapons program? And a lot of this work you can already see done by uh, amazing research groups at, for example, the Center for Nonproliferation Studies at Middlebury Monterey, work at Stanford itself, 38 North in, in Washington, where groups, teams of analysts are looking at the, a large amount of information coming in now from commercial satellite constellations and doing a lot of analysis and research, again, using big, big data techniques to help to understand what's going on with the North Korean nuclear program. So I do think that there are a lot of new uh, potential tools out there. I do wonder about their negotiability. You know, what's it going to take to sell the North Koreans on, on using commercial satellite constellations as uh, an aspect of how their systems are monitored? We'll see, because a lot uh, has not been tested yet at the negotiating table. But I am quite optimistic about the future of verification and monitoring, because I think we do have such great technological tools available to us now. Well, as we begin to wrap up here, I can't let you get away without talking about your new book that is coming out this month, uh, Negotiating the New START Treaty. Um, you were the first woman to lead a major nuclear arms negotiation. Um, what was that like? And you you write in this book about that experience. Talk, talk to us about that. Well, in some ways, I don't know if it was uh, different from any uh, diplomat, any negotiator. The experience of negotiating the treaty was very much helped by the fact that we had high-level attention throughout. President Obama was super focused on getting this treaty done, so I often felt like the president himself was breathing down my neck, although that wasn't the case. He had a lot of, a lot of concerns, of course, but certainly Washington was very focused on what we were doing in Geneva. And uh, frankly, so was President Medvedev. Uh, both presidents uh, agreed that they would get the new START treaty negotiated before START went out of force in December of 2009. So we had a hard deadline, and we were, we were uh, really fighting to reach that deadline. Unfortunately, it did pass, but we did get the treaty done a few months later, and it was into force uh, by February of 2011. So um, in some ways, it was a traditional negotiation. I will say the differences had to do, I think, with how I was regarded at the negotiating table. And here um, I have some funny vignettes in the book the most funny one from my perspective is, you know, the Russians knew me. I've long been an expert working on nuclear arms control matters and, and the strategic nuclear forces of the USSR and Russia. What I didn't expect was that my own delegation of men would say to me, you need to show more temper at the negotiating table. And you're, you know, you're being too, too easygoing. And so one day I just decided to throw a temper tantrum and I, you know, pounded my hand on the table and I turned bright red and uh, my delegation were jubilant afterwards. They just thought that was great. But I just wanted to say that, you know, male negotiators have all kinds of techniques and all kinds of range. Some of them are, are real prima donnas and they love to throw temper tantrums. I'm mixing female and male metaphors here, but and some are very measured in their approach and never throw temper tantrums. I'm pretty much on the measured side, but when I needed to throw a temper tantrum, I could do that. And when I proved that 
the men on my delegation were happy. Mm -hmm. And one final question here. The, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the New START Treaty was extended last year and it goes until 2026. Right. Any concerns about what may happen in the, between now and 2026 with the New START in terms of getting it extended even further? Well, New START will not be extended any further. The terms of the treaty uh, were, it was written so that it could be extended for five years, um, but not an additional extension beyond that. So uh, I'm very glad that President Biden and President Putin have decided that it's a top priority to uh, negotiate a follow-on to the New START treaty. It will not be easy. I've mentioned several times that warheads should come into the new treaty, limits on warheads should come into the new treaty, and this will require some complicated work on verification techniques because of the sensitivity of nuclear warheads and the facilities where they are stored. So that that's not going to be uh, an easy lift, but it is something that, that will have to be worked on. But the two presidents said it as a priority in the next five years to get that follow-on treaty negotiated. Uh, and so I do think we have the time to do it now. And so uh, I think I think that's the most important thing. Well, Rose Scott Miller, this has been a phenomenal conversation. I always learn things when I talk to you, which is why I love talking to you. Thank you so much for being here with us here at the Future Strategy Forum today. Really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Beverly. It's always a great pleasure to be with you. You're a tremendous interviewer. And thank you to everybody watching today for the great questions. Yes, and thanks to all of you for joining us.